Uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is our lecture to uh, BUS 102, Introduction to Statistic for Business. Um, our lecture will be, our first lecture will be in chapter one and two. So chapter one is about what is the statistic. It will give you um, a description of the statistic, definition, uh, different type uh, of measurement, and general information about a statistic. For chapter one, this is the topic we'll cover in this chapter. Uh, now let's talk about it. Why statistic is important? We know statistic is used to make a valid uh, comparison and to predict the outcome of decision. A good working knowledge of statistic is useful for summarizing and organizing data to provide information that is useful and supportive for of decision making. What does that mean? Imagine you're working to uh, working for a company, and they want to introduce a new phone to the market. And your manager or your supervisor ask you to address this and give them a feedback about um, their product, which is the phone. First, you would, first thought is come to your mind. Yes, it will be successful, but you cannot make this decision without any like any data that you have so first you have to address if this phone it will meet user needs it will be make a profit for the company you have to address all of these before you make this decision so you cannot add you cannot say yes is useful without uh, collecting data organizing summarize your data analysis your data so you cannot say yes or no without any of uh, any useful or supportive data that you have to make your decision right okay so that's why you see in most major like economic uh, uh, accounting uh, business uh, account uh, was either banking so any major in this area usually they uh, they study statistic to get just the general idea about how to deal with this data that's why they require you to statistic here. Okay. Data are collected anywhere and require statistic knowledge to make information useful. Statistic techniques are used to make professional and personal decision. No matter what your career, you will need a knowledge of statistics to understand the world and to be um, confident in your career. Understanding of statistics and statistic method will help you make effective personal and pers professional decision. That's what I said. If you understand how to apply your statistic uh, skill, then you can make effective personal, personal and professional decision. Okay, so now what is the statistic? Statistic is basically science. Science of what? Of collecting, organizing, presenting, analyzing, analyzing and interpreting data to assist in making more effective decision. So with this data, you can make your decision based on the outcome of this data. Okay, I have uh, two uh, important def definitions because we will use them a lot in our course. We have a population and sample. So population, it's uh, the entire set of individual or object of interest. So it's either entire set of individual or the measurement that obtained from all individual or object of interest. For example, if I ask you to uh, collect the data from your employee in, uh, in your company about um, how they interest, for example, in social media, okay? So I'm asking you to collect the data from all members in your company. Then we call this data population because it's dependent on all your employees in your company. Okay, but if we ask you to collect data from specific department in your company, for example, collect the, uh, like how many people interested in using social media from HR department. So I'm now, and I didn't ask you to collect the data from all the members in your company. Only specific department, which is considered as a sample. 
So sample is a portion or a part of a population of interest. Okay, so the difference is between them, population, it's all the data. Sample is a part or portion from this data. Okay, so let's see this example. Here, I have, uh, I have, I think 36 car. So I have 36 car. Okay, uh, which is all the items I have in my, let's say in my, um, I have this data, for example, uh, in the store. Okay, I have this card and these all the cards I have in my store. Okay, and when I conduct survey on these cards, then uh, I'm, I'm going to apply all my cards here. Okay, but if I only select randomly or select a specific uh, color or specific model, then let's say here I chose only six cards from the population. So the six cards here is, co is considered as a sample because they were an item selected from the population. Okay, so here population, it's the whole things. Another example of I said, um, conduct a study on Saudi Arabia population. I'm here ask you to conduct uh, the study on every single one in Saudi Arabia. Okay, but if we ask you to conduct your survey on only West region, for example, West region of Saudi Arabia. So you only conduct your study on this sample, which is people in West region of Saudi Arabia. Oh, here's the difference, okay? Okay, I have two types of statistics. There are two types. The first type is called uh, descriptive and inferential. Descriptive and inferential, they consider as a two types of statistics. Uh, descriptive uh, statistic is method of organizing, summarizing, presented data in informative way. So you will in this um, in this type you will, you could organize your data and provide information that easy to understand. Okay. So for example, you can provide your information that how many people uh, like to uh, buy ice cream in the supermarket. So you will count them, organize the data by age, by, for example, uh, by gender. So you can organize this data and make it more, uh, like make it, uh, you can organize it in a formative way that anyone you can read it and understand it. In French, Inferential uh, statistic can be used to estimate properties of a population based on sample taken from that population. As I said, you can conduct your study, for example, in Western people, and then apply your study to all people in Saudi Arabia as an inferential statistic, which is come from uh, infer word, which is mean. Uh, estimate okay you can be used to estimate properties of, of a population based on a sample so you will conduct your study on sample and then apply to the whole people okay so as you see here statistic the two types is descriptive and inferential uh, in descriptive uh, statistic uh, usually there are central tendency measure uh, dispersion measure and correlation measures. I'm going to discover these two uh, our study. Uh, there is a method for this secretive statistic. Uh, you can collect the data by conducting survey interviews and you can present your data by tables and the graphs. So you can, after you collect your data and organize it, you can represent it like a graphs like this or like a table okay and you can summarize your data by some tools like sample mean uh, median mod and this stuff okay so this usually we did with the descriptive statistic we usually collect a uh, big method for collecting and presenting and summarizing okay now 
uh, we have also a term uh, variables. So we have a types of variables. We have qualitative variable and quantitative variables. Uh, there is a big difference between them, but qualitative variable usually deal with non-numeric, uh, non-numeric characteristic. Quantitative is always based on numbers. Okay, so qualitative variable, an object or individual is observed or recorded as a non-numeric characteristic, as a non-numeric characteristic. For example, gender, uh, state of birth, a color. Gender, you can say female, male. They all without number. There is no number here. A color, you can say a uh, brown, a uh, black, gray. There is no number here. A quantitative variable, a variable that is reported numerically, which is with numbers, usually with numbers. Okay. For example, balance in your checking account. This is number. It could be thousand, could be five hundred, and so on. Life of a car battery, also it's number. Uh, the number of people employed by company, also number. So this, the big difference between them. Is quantitative variable deal with non-numeric and quantitative with numbers. Okay, let's talk about quantitative variable. Okay, quantitative uh, variable can be discrete or continuous. Can be discrete or continuous. Uh, what does that mean? Discrete variable are typically the result of counting. So you can you can assume only certain number value. Okay. For example, if I ask you how many bedrooms in your room, you can say I have three bedrooms. There is a certain number. If I ask you uh, how many numbers of students in a statistic course, for example, then you can say I have we have uh, 30 students in um, statistic course. So here there is a number. Continuous variable are usually the result of measuring something, and they are between a specific range. Okay, so you can assume any value within a specific range. For example, uh, the air uh, pressure in, in a tire, it could be between 32 to 30, I think, 5. So you can assume any number between this interval. Times, I can say between 12 to 6, for example. I can assume any number between this interval. Number should be a specific range, okay? So this one, a specific number, you can say three, four, uh, I have three bedroom, I have three people in my, uh, in my class, I have um, three students like this. Continuous variable, you can usually is the result of measuring something. So you can assume any value with a specific range, okay? So to sum up, we can say, the variable, we have two main variables. We have qualitative and quantitative. Uh, qualitative, it has nothing to do with uh, numbers. They're usually non-numeric, which is hair color, material status, and all stuff. Uh, quantitative, usually they deal with number, like a discrete and continuous. Discrete, like a number of children in family, continuous. It's like an amount of income uh, of tax paid. This is usually between a specific range. Uh, there is no center number here. Uh, weight of the student, of course, the weight changeable. For example, this month may weight, let's say 50. Next month will be 55. So is it changeable and so on. Now let's we'll talk about level of measurement. Uh, the level of measurement uh, determine the required statistical analysis. Okay, so we have four main uh, four main level of measurement. We have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Okay, so we have nominal, ordinal, interval, and we're gonna go deep uh, to each one to distinguish the differences between these four. Okay, so nominal. Data a nominal level, data recorded 
uh, as a label or name, okay? As a label or name, there is no order. So there is no order here. They can only classify and count it, that's it. For example, what is your gender? You can say female and, you can say male and female. There is no order here, okay? Data here, it's only label or name. Uh, so there is no order here. What is your hair color? It could be brown, black. So all the data here, there is no order. No one is better than other, okay? They all only classify, okay? Now, uh, if you ask you where did you live, you can say north, south, or neither. This is only labels or names, no order. So remember, in nominal, there is no uh, order. The uh, second level of measurement is ordinal level, okay? In ordinal level, ranking are knowing, okay? Ranking are knowing. I know this is better than this, but not the magnitude of differences between groups. I know, but there is no, um, like no numbers or no uh, thing I can, know what's the difference between the groups. I only know this is a different than this and this is better than this, like this. So in ordinal level of measurement, data recording at the ordinal level of measurement is based on relative ranking rating of items, okay? Based on defined uh, attribute or quilt variable. And variable based on this level of measurement are only ranked and counted. I'm gonna give you an example, see? If we ask you, how did you feel today? I'm gonna see, I'm, I'm very happy, unhappy, I'm okay, okay? So here there is a difference, there's a difference between uh, happy or very happy and unhappy, okay? There's a difference here, but you cannot know how, uh, how long is different. Okay, it's not measurable. Here, if I say how satisfied with you with our service, if you can, I'm satisfied. I'm not satisfied. Uh, somewhat unsatisfied. You know, there's a different. There's an a ranking here because satisfied or very satisfied is different than somewhat satisfied. But you cannot distinguish how the difference between these. Okay. Third one is called interval level. So the next level is interval level, which is for this one, data recorded, uh, data recorded here. And the interval or distance between value is meaningful. So the differences between each value is important here. So it's based on scale with knowing unit of measurement. So you will know uh, the unit of measurement here and uh, the distance between the values is meaningful. For example, if I said, um, let's say you are a student and there is a, a scale of your grade, let's say 100, okay, let's say 100, okay. A second. One second. Let's say hundred and seventy. One second. Okay. Uh, Okay, let's say, let's say, make sure my screen is sharing. Yes. Okay, let's say uh, I, uh, the scales. So it's, you'll get started from 100, uh, 90, 98, 97, 
96, 95, and so on until 90, uh, 89, okay? So if you are a student and receive, for example, 95, so this is, it consider, for example, A minus. If you receive 89, this is considered as a B, okay? B plus. So from here, you know they are ranked and the differences are important because if you are a student and receive uh, 95, you will gonna take uh, A minus. If you receive 79, then you will have to receive A plus, for example. So the difference is here, they both A, but there's a difference because if you receive 95, you will get A minus. If you receive 97, you will get A plus, okay? So here in interval level, usually uh, the distance between value is, is meaningful. And there is no net, a natural zero point here, uh, so, which means zero is not represent um, the absent. Uh, interval scale and numerical scale. As I described here, they are numerical scale. Example, Fahrenheit and Celsius temperature scale. Uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius, which is started from one and so 100, for example, 120, they all numbers. A dress size, for example, if your size is X, S is different than small, different than medium, different than large, than X large. So this is the size, okay? And the scale here is knowing because the unit of measurement is knowing, but X small is different than medium and so on. X small, let's say, is 34, for example, centimeter, and large is 40. So the difference is here is important. Okay, ratio. The highest level of measurement is the ratio level. Okay, uh, because data on all characteristic here and uh, it has all the characteristic of interval, uh, interval scale, and the ratio. The ratio between these numbers are meaningful. Okay, the uh, the zero point here. Sorry. Okay, uh, the zero point here is represent the absence of characteristic. So here, data all uh, has all the characteristic of uh, interval scale, which is mean ranking and the distance is meaningful. And the ratio here is between number and meaningful. Okay, we're gonna see here. The record, uh, data here recorded at the ratio level of measurement are based on a scale with knowing unit of measurement and meaningful interpretation of zero in the scale. Example, wages, change in stock price and weights. okay? As you see here, here's the number, uh, here's my data. Uh, for example, uh, I have uh, this family. The father earn, uh, like by year, earn uh, 80, $80,000. And his son earned forty thousand dollar. Okay, so what's the difference here? I can say his father earned twice as his son. So there is a ratio here. Okay, in this term of data, I could say this data is in. I can measure it in term of ratio level. Okay. Here the, to sum up, I could say I have four uh, four levels of measurement. I have nominal. Ordinal, uh, ordinal interval and ratio. The nominal, it's only names, or it's only class, uh, class, classified as a named or label. There is no order here, no numbers. An ordinal level, I could say names, and the order, the order here is important. Um, in the interval level, the name here is important. It could be names also, and the orders, is important and the, uh, the differences between the values is important here. In the ratio level, the name is important, the order and the ratio, uh, the differences between the value is important also, and it can accommodate absolute zero, which is zero represented the absences of value, okay? So this is 
contain all the characteristics of the other level of measurements. Okay, this is to summarize. Okay, nominal data can be classified, ordinal data can be data is ranked, interval meaningful differences between value. And for ratio, it's meaningful also the differences and zero also. Uh, the zero is uh, describe the absence of value, which is meaningful here. Okay, let's practice. Question one, consider, consider the graph uh, of orders done by customers at Italian restaurant offer a given week. Okay. So first, what type of variable under study? Okay, this is the number of orders in one week, okay? And uh, in one restaurant, they have some uh, dishes, pasta, pizza, uh, risotto, and calzone, okay? And the question asks, what type of variable under study? So this variable is considered as a qualitative data. Qualitative, sorry, qualitative data because there's no number here, okay? And according to the customer, what is the most favorite order? We're gonna see here the most favorite order, which is the number, which number is, uh, which dish um, has like more order? during the week, here the pasta 11, pizza 15, rosette to eight and calzone 16. So the calzone, the calzone is the most ordinary one. So it's calzone. Okay, how many order were done during the week? The, the question here asks how many numbers of orders during the week? Okay, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna count them. So 15, uh, 11 plus 15, okay, plus 8, plus 16, which is 50 orders during the week. Okay, so what is the percentage of pizza order? The question now asks about specific dish, which, which is uh, the pizza, which is this one. I have 50 order during the week. So uh, to calculate the percentage as we learn in BOS 101, we're gonna first take the number of pizza and divide it by the total of numbers, which is we find it from C, 15 order. We're gonna take the part, divide it by the total, and then by percentage, okay? So it's gonna be, I could say like this, or divided by 100. So it's gonna be 15 divided uh, by 50. So it's gonna be 30, 100. So 30 percentage, the pizza were ordering due, from total ordering during this, uh, during the week. Now, uh, a sample of 500 customer will ask, how did you know about our product? Okay, so the answer are summarized in the uh, uh, graph, as you see here, this is the customer answer. Okay, so they, they um, take the data and find the most category people know about their project from billboards here, uh, radio and TV, social media, and friends and neighbors, okay? So they, after they done the study, they found this is the most, the most um, like category or the most resource people know about the product from, okay? So now, what type of variable under this study? Since they found, they found, uh, they know about the product from these uh, sources, so it's only label, which is qualitative data. 
Okay. Now, suggest another graph that can be used to represent the data. Here it's called by chart, and there's another one called bar chart. Okay. Then we could use it to describe this data. You can write it like this, and then put your data like this after you done. Okay. So this is called a bar chart. Uh, the last question asked about it. How many customers knew about product from billboard? So this is the billboard. Okay. And I have 20% of the total sample. They know about my product from billboard. Then I'm going to say 20 percentage, or I can say 20 over 100. So then say 20 over 100 multiplied by my total sample, which is 500, okay, equal to, I'm gonna divide, I'm gonna uh, uh, say 20 times 500 divided by 100, which is 100 customer. So I have 100 customers they know from my product from Billboard. Okay. Hope it is clear. And this is the end of chapter one. And we're going to describe chapter two. We're going to move to the chapter two. Okay. And now let's move to the chapter two. Uh, chapter two is uh, basically about describing data, frequency tables, uh, distribution, and the graphic presentation. Okay, so we're gonna discover this topic um, about summarizing the supply and summarize quantitative. Okay, now uh, recall that from chapter one, the techniques used to describe set of data are called a descriptive statistic. It's called descriptive uh, statistic uh, because they organize data to show general pattern of the data to identify where its value tend to constrate and expose uh, expose extreme or unusual data values. Okay, so as we now move into chapter two, we're gonna talk about frequency table, which is the first technique that we will discuss. Okay, frequency table, we're gonna learn how to create a frequency table, how to organize it, how to uh, identify how many classes that we need. Okay, so what finish? What is the frequency table? The frequency table is a grouping of qualitative data into mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive classes, showing the number of observations in each class. Okay, so for example, I have. Okay. I have this table, I, I will say, for example, and I'm going to say uh, I have, I'm in a school and I have a student. Okay, uh, I'm going to see how many students or how many I could observe a student in math class, for example, Arabic class, uh, Islamic class. So all of these is considered as the classes. And let's say I have uh, 15 students, 20 students, uh, 17 students, okay? So the number of students in math class is 15. The number of students in Arabic class is 20. So that's me, the frequency table. This is the, like, the basic idea about frequency table. So it will showing the number of observation in the number of uh, observation in each class. Okay, now let's say this example. Uh, here uh, is the frequency table for, uh, for vehicles sold last month at Apple World Auto Group. By, they organize the data only by uh, location. Okay, so the data here, it will be fit in one class, which is the, the location. Uh, the number of cars were sold in Kane, 52, and only 40. In Chaplin, uh, 45 in Tunista, 43 
and the total of this car is 180. Okay, so mutually exclusive means the data fit in just one class. Collectively exhaustive means there is a class for each value. There is a class for each value. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, every month, okay, Apple World collect data from each uh, of the four dealership and enter them in a uh, Excel spreadsheet. So last month they sold 180 vehicle for the, from this uh, four dealership. Okay, so the the variable they are collected include profit, location, vehicle type, and previous, which is the number uh, of vehicle previously purchased at any of four Apple World dealership. Okay, so now, as you see, this is my data. So here, if you, I say, uh, for example, uh, the profit, which is the amount earned by dealership. So in, in age, for example, 21, we receive a profit of 1,378. So here's the classes, as you see. This is my classes. So this is uh, a good example of that. Okay. Now let's move to the graphic. So graphic, uh, graphic presentation of a qualitative data. Uh, we have the most common one, which is called bar chart. This is the first one, bar chart, which is so uh, shows the qualitative classes uh, in the horizontal uh, axis, which is this. And the classes frequency on the vertical axis, which is this, okay? And the classes frequency are proportional to the highest height of the bar. For example, uh, in this example, as you see, see this table, uh, I have 52 were sold in cane, 40 were sold in Olin, uh, 45 were sold in Shetland. Then I'm gonna organize this data or I'm gonna present this data. I'm gonna first, okay, uh, uh, write two lines, vertical and vertical. Here I'm gonna put my qualitative data. Okay, and here I'm gonna put the number of frequency. Okay, um, frequency. This is how to create your bar chart. See, this is the um, the quantitative qualitative classes, and this is the number of frequency. Okay, so I'm starting from 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and I can complete it as 60, for example, and so on. I could put it as 0, 5, 10, 5, uh, 15, sorry, 20, and so on. Okay, so now when you see this bar chart, you will know which location has the most number. Okay, because from the first glance, I could see K is the most uh, location, uh, the most car we sold in this location, which is 52. And I, I could say, uh, I could also notice that all in has the lowest number, which is 40. So the big idea here is to use bar chart when you wish to compare the number of observation for each class of a qualitative variable. So if you see this graph, okay, with this data, you can immediately notice that how many uh, car were sold in this location, which location has the most number, which location has the lowest number, only from the graph even though you didn't have any data, okay? But this graph, you cannot construct it without you having actual data, okay? Another way to present the data is called by chart. So by chart is, so, uh, is uh, basically showing the proportion of uh, or percentage that each class represented of the total number of frequency, okay? So we use this when you wish to compare relative differences in percentage or uh, of observation for each class of a qualitative variable. Okay, 
let's say here, this is uh, the vehicle type. Okay, I have sedan, SUV, compact, truck, hybrid, were sold uh, last month. So the number sold from sedan car, which is 72. The percentage of this number is 40. So here is 40%. SUV is 30%. And so on, they all okay. The total is 100. How, how I gonna draw this? If I want to represent this in pie chart, I'm gonna first start okay to write the circle, and then I'm gonna divide the circle to four parts. Let's say here 0, 25, 50, 75. Okay. I just divided it to make it easier to me to draw all the portion, okay? So first one, it's C down, which is 40%. Then I'm gonna move 0, 25. So it should be something like this. So this is my 40. So I'm gonna draw it like this. This is my 40. Of course, if you using software, it will be easier. Okay, this is 40. Now, if I want to draw the other portion, which is SUV, to consider as a 30, I'm going to start from where I stop. I stop here in 40, then I'm going to add it 30, which is from here 10, 20, and here 30, which is uh, 70. Okay. Here is 70, and here it's going to represent 40%, and here it's going to represent 30% from here, okay? Now I'm going to uh, uh, draw the portion of compact. Compact is considered as a 15 percentage, then I'm going to move from 7 to 50, uh, 75 is 5, then I'm going to move here to 85 which is considered now as a 15 percentage, okay? For a track, they only only 10%, so it's gonna be something like this, uh, 95, okay? And the rest will be hybrid, which is five percentage, okay? So if you're using software, this will be easier, but I wanted to show you how to start off to draw this graph. If a manual, hopefully it's clear. We usually uh, use these two types of chart to represent the qualitative data. Okay. Now let's move to constructing frequency frequency table. So first, you have to sort the data into classes. Count the number in each class and report it as a class frequency. For example, as I told you before, if I have if I am in school and I have like some um, uh, uh, the school student and when I put them in into uh, like uh, classes depended on the subject, for example, math, okay, math, uh, Islamic, Arabic, okay. Then I'm gonna uh, count how many is of the student in math, 10, 12, and here let's say 17. Okay, so I first I sort my data into classes, which is my classes here in math, classes and Arabic, and count the number in each class and report it as a classes frequency. So the frequency here of math student, 10, and the frequency of Islamic student, 12 and Arabic 70 and so on. So this is the basic idea. Now, what is the relative frequency? How to convert from frequency to a relative frequency? Relative frequency, it, it's um, when you take this, uh, the frequency number and divide it by the total numbers, okay? Uh, usually it's a fraction, which is show the total number of observation in each class. 
let's say I'm going to describe it here in example. So from this uh, table, the total of the students here is 32. No. Sorry. The total of the students here is 42. Okay. So what is the relative frequency for each class? For math student, that's going to be 10 over 42 because 42 is the total. So this is the frequency relative for math student. Uh, let me put it here, just one second, to make it easier. Okay. So for the total number of this, uh, student is 42. Okay. Then I'm gonna describe uh, the relative frequency so here is going to be 10 over 42 and here is going to be 12 over 42 and here is going to be 70 over 42. 42 is the total number of my student. This is the relative frequency, okay? So you will put each of the class frequencies divided by the total of number of observation as we did. So this is if you ask you to count uh, the relative frequency, okay? Now, uh, how to construct frequency distribution? Okay, frequency distribution is a grouping of quantitative. The previous, we already organized uh, analysis data for qualitative. Okay, when you construct here, frequency table for qualitative data. Now we're going to move to quantitative data. So constructed frequency distribution is a grouping of quantitative data into mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive classes showing the number of, of observation in each class. In this process, we have four steps to create our uh, frequency distribution. Uh, so first, we're going to decide it on the number of uh, classes. Second, we're going to determine the class interval. Three, we're going to set the individual class limited. And four, we're going to tally the data into classes and determine the number of the observation in each class. Okay? So that's, uh, this is the process. And to make it clear, I'm going to throw it each step by example to make it clear. See this data? So this is the type of data after you conduct your study, you will end up with similar data like this. For example, from the Applewood uh, Auto Group, when they first uh, collect the profit on the hatred sold last month, they end up with this raw data. We call this raw data. Okay. From the raw data, if your manager or your supervisor asks you to give them the summaries of this data, you cannot give them like this. Okay, there is there is many steps to do this data. How do we call it? Create construction frequency distribution. So first step here, we'll get it decided on the number of the classes. Okay, so here I have one hundred eighty. Uh, number of data. If you count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you will end up here, you have 180 data. Okay, 80 number of that, uh, 180 number of data. Then, now, my n here is equal to 180. Okay, we'll get decided on the number of the classes. I have a formula. My formula is n to power k is greater than n. This is the formula. You have to use it to decide it on the number of the classes when you, construction, when you construct the frequency distribution. So, as we say, n is the number of values in the data set. And from this table, from this um, data, after we count them, we find n is equal to 180. K is the number of classes, okay? 
and we have to find a value of k from two. This is my formula. Two to the power k is greater than n, which means two to the power k is greater than 180. Okay, because we found n 180. So which power? Okay, which power? Which the first power that k exceed n? We're gonna first. Uh, let's try two to the power five, for example. Okay, two to the power five is the uh, is the greater than hundred. So two to the power five is equal to thirty two, and thirty two is not greater than sorry, is not greater than one hundred eighty. So this is wrong. If I pick k is equal to five, this is wrong. Let's say k is equal to seven. Okay. So I'm going to say here 2 to the power of 7 is equal 2 to the power of 7 is equal to 128, which is, is not greater also than 180. Let's say k is equal to 8. I'm going to say 2 to the power 8. Okay, 2 to the power eight is equal to 256, which is greater than 180. So now, now we talk. So now I found my K. My K here is equal to eight, because when I try my formula, I found now this number is exceed 180. So my K here is equal to eight, okay? How to this is how to find k. This is important because k is the number of classes that I have to construct. Okay, so now we have eight classes. Done from the step one. Step two, we have to determine the class interval. Okay, also I have another formula. So class interval, I'm gonna just represent it by r is greater than or equal the highest value minus the lowest value divided by k. And our k here, we find it from step one, is equal to eight. So what is the highest value? We're gonna look to our data. This is our data. So what is the maximum value? It's 3,292. And what is the lowest value? It's 294 okay so they will get a move back here we'll get a, the highest value here we subtract lowest value and then divide it by k which is 8 and then uh, h minus l which represented the highest and lowest divided by k and we put the the value divided by eight, which is equal to 374.75, okay? So this is my i. So now my i should be greater than 374.75, okay? So now I'm gonna round up to the some convenient number. So I'm gonna say, uh, let's say four, Okay, 400 is a convenient number because it's greater than 374.75. So I round now to the 400. So this is uh, the step you have to do it to round to some convenient number. I chose here to round to 400. So the interval is also here. The interval here is also referred to the class with it. So now I found my I. So my I here is equal to 400, okay? What I is, I is the class interval, which is, I'm gonna start, uh, I'm gonna put uh, the class interval equal to 400. 
Step three, I have to set the individual class limit. I have to set the individual class limit, which is I'm gonna start with uh, the lowest the uh, the lowest value I have in my data, which is two hundred ninety-four. This is the lowest the lowest value I have. Then I'm gonna round it to easy to read number. I'm gonna start it round it to the lowest, which is two hundred. Okay, this is all you chosen. You can say two hundred fifty. It's up to you. But for me, I'm gonna choose two hundred to make it the lower value. So there is no value from my data is below two hundred. Okay, this is important. You have to lower to the lowest number. Now. How I can uh, set my data? I'm gonna say here. Just one second. So here, as you see, I'm gonna start from the lowest point, the lowest uh, limit, which is 200. Okay. I'm gonna add it the uh, interval, the class interval, which is 400. Then 200 plus 400 is equal to 600. Then I'm going to put the limited of the first uh, class to 600. Then I'm going to add it 600 plus 400 equal to 1000. So this is my second interval. Then I'm going to 1000 minus 400 is going to 400. So I'm going to starting by uh, adding uh, 400, which is the interval uh, which is the class interval to each one, okay? So here, all my interval in the same width, which is all 400. Because if you're going from 200 to 600, it's 400. If you're going from 600 to 1000, it's also 400, and so on, okay? And last step, we have tallied the individual data into classes and determined the number of observation in each class. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna start by putting my classes as I found it from the areas. So first class is from 200 to $600, okay? I'm gonna go to the my previous data and see how many frequency between this interval. So it's between, remember, it's between 200 and 600. So I'm gonna go back. Okay, how many? Okay, between 200 and six. I'm gonna just start by finding out how many. So two, three, four, six. Okay. Six here and then seven, eight. So that's it. So I have eight observation in the first interval, which is from uh, 200 to 600. Okay, so now I have, I have eight observation, okay. I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, five, one, uh, six, seven, eight. This is eight observation. This is how to uh, write, how to draw the frequency. Okay. For example, I have six, so it's one, two, three, four, five, and then six. Sorry. And then six. Also, if I have, let's say, uh, 14, then I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and one, two, three, which is 14. So now I have 14 frequencies. We usually draw it like this to make it easier. Or you can write it by number. So I can, I can say the frequency here, eight, and now this is, we're done for the first class. Let's go to the other class. The other class is 
between 600 and 1000. So I'm gonna go back to my data, find how many I have, okay, between uh, 600 and 1000. So we're gonna start by looking. So I have one here, two here, three here, four here, Five, and then six here, seven here, eight, nine, we still have more. Okay, I think we still, let's see. Okay. So it should be 11. Uh, how much we found in right? uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So there is two more. Let's say, where is it? Yes, here is 1 and 2. So now we have 11 uh, frequencies between the interval between 600 to 2000. So all the data I asserted now is between these numbers. Okay, so now it's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. Each one of this uh, line is represented one frequency, one frequency, okay? So now I'm gonna say I have here 11, and so on for all the rest of the frequencies, okay? So now the total of frequency should be equal to the your number of data, which is 180. If you make a sum of the frequencies, it should be 180, which is the total of your raw data. Okay, now what about the relative frequency distribution? First of all, the relative frequency, as we said before, is the number uh, of frequency in one, uh, one class divided by the number of frequencies. Okay, so the total of number in one class divided on the total of the num uh, number of frequencies. So to find the relative frequency, simplify Take the class frequency and divide it by the total number of observation. As we say here, the total number, which is n, is equal to 180. This is the total number. So I'm gonna take, see, I'm gonna take the number of each frequency in one class, okay, and divide it by the total number, which is uh, 100, uh, 180. So I'm gonna say, here I have eight, so eight divided by 180, which is equal to uh, 0 0.044, okay? For the second one, I'm gonna say 11 divided by 180, it's gonna be zero, uh, 0 0.061, okay? So you will do it for all of them to find the relative frequency. You have to memorize this formula, to, in order to find the relative frequency, if the question asks about the, frequ uh, the relative frequency. Okay, now I have an example. Let's apply that, uh, what we have read. Here in survey aiming to study the average number of cars per household or family, and how does that reflect on public transportation? So the following uh, data was collected, as you see here. I have uh, the number of cars, okay, uh, zero, one, two, three, four. And I have the number of family frequency, which is mean uh, how many um, 
families, like for example, have have no cars. How many uh, family have one car? How many family have two cars? And three, and so on. Okay, and we uh, we're gonna we're gonna count the relative frequencies. Okay, so now we're gonna find the relative frequency for each value of x. Now we have the number of family frequency, which is twelve, and we have the total, which is hundred. Remember the relative frequency. Take the number in each class and divide it by the total. So for here, I'm gonna divide. I'm gonna divide twelve by hundred, which is equal to zero one two. Hundred is the total of the family frequency. Okay. Now for the second one. The name, uh, the number of uh, family frequency who have only one car is 15. So 15 divided by 100 is equal to 0, 15. Okay, the number of family frequency who has two cars is 36. Three, six. So 36 divided by 100 is equal to 0, 36. Also, the number of family frequency uh, who has three cars is 18. So 18 divided by the total, which is 100, is going to be 0 0.18. Lastly, the total number, uh, the numbers of family frequency who, have, who has four cars is 19 divided by the total number of observation, which is 100, it's going to be 0 0.19. Okay, so this is how to uh, count the relative frequency. Now, okay, now the question ask number B, ask about how many families own at least two cars. So if you see at least two cars, which means they may, uh, ha they may have two, three, four cars. Okay, so it's gonna be two, either two, three, or four cars. So I'm gonna make a sum of the number of frequency of these classes. I'm gonna make a sum of 36 plus 18 plus 19, which is equal to 73 families. Okay, since the question ask at least, the question, uh, doesn't specify any uh, class and cl uh, like any class. It say at least two cars, so it could be two, three, or four, larger than two. Okay. Now see what's the percentage of family having no car. This is zero, which has been they have no car. So the number of family frequency uh, has no car uh, have no car is twelve. So I'm gonna say twelve. Okay, uh, 12, which is the portion, the total number of family we conduct our study is 100. Okay, and since the question asks about the percentage, then I'm gonna divide it by 100. And it's gonna be by cancellation method. So it's gonna 12 percentage. So the percentage of families having no car is 12 percentage okay we we count this by dividing the numbers of family having no car on the total of number now for uh for graphic presentation of frequency distribution we have his we have a histogram which is a graph in which uh, the classes are marked in uh horizontal axis and the classes frequency in the vertical axis. So see here, it's my classes. And on the vertical axis, there is uh, the classes frequency. Okay, so the classes frequency are represented by the high, high height of the bar. So you can see here, for example, the first uh, class, it's eight, okay. Second one is eight. So each height 
uh, means number, okay? So the bar, uh, the bars are drawing adjusted to each other. There is no space, okay? This, they are all classes, so it should be no space there. It's different than the bar chart because the bar chart is represent qualitative data. So there is no classes there, but here is the classes and it should be no space. Like as you see here, Okay, so my interval starts from, let's say, from two to six. This is my first interval on my first class. Second class starts from six, uh, let's say, to 10. And the second one starts from 10 uh, to 40. Okay, and the number of frequency, let's say, five, uh, zero, five. Uh, 10, 15, okay? So if I can draw that, so this is my first interval. It's five, for example. So I'm gonna say this. This is my first, the whole class, which is five or let five or six, okay? Now, the second interval, if I wanted to draw it, let's say it's 10. So I'm gonna draw it starting here from 10 which means any number between this class, it's 10, okay? So the number here between the each class is 10, which is the frequency of this uh, class represented as a 10, and so on. So there is no space here, okay? Now in 10, let's say there are seven. So I'm gonna, uh, draw it like this, okay, which is seven here. So you cannot separate them because they are, uh, they are in classes and the classes, um, the classes, they uh, related to each other, okay? And each class is dedicated as rectangular with the height of bar represented the number in each class. So, the height here is represented how many numbers in each class, which is in my example here, here is uh, six, and here is 10, here is seven. So it represents the whole class, okay? So back to our example here, here's the number of frequency and here my uh, classes of a profit. So between 200 and six dollar, uh, I have eight frequencies between six hundred and uh, eight uh, and one thousand uh, dollar. I have eleven frequencies between a uh, thousand and hundred and thousand four hundred four hundred. I have thirty two. Okay, so this is the basic idea about the histogram. The other one we use is frequency polygon. Okay, this one is dependent on the midpoint. So you get it to first find the midpoint of each class that you have. Okay, so frequency polygon is similar to a histogram, also showing the shape of that uh, of distribution. Here, for example, here in histogram, I could say my data like this. So the shape, this is the shape of my data. I can I can uh, distinguish my shape here from the histogram. Same for the polygon, but here is using the midpoint. Okay, so uh, polygon is also uh, good to use when comparing two or more distribution. So let's first say what is the midpoint. Midpoint. I have this class, for example. Then I'm gonna take 200 plus 600 divided on two. I'm gonna take the first number and the second, last number, make a sum and divide it in two. Then it's gonna be 800, 400, okay? This is to find the midpoint for the first interval or the first class. Let's say first class. Okay, second class, 
I have 600 and 1,000. I'm going to make a sum of them. Divide this by two. It's going to... Eight hundred. So this is the second, the second uh, midpoint for the second class. And repeat the process. Okay. So repeat the, all the process until you finish from the midpoint. So now you will draw your midpoint here, starting from zero, four hundred, eight hundred which is represent the midpoint that you calculate, okay? And you will put the frequency on the vertical, okay? Now you're gonna look to the midpoint here, which is 400, and where is eight, which is here? So we're gonna put a dot here. You're gonna now see for the second class, you will see there is 800 here and the number of frequency is 11. So this is the frequency of the original classes before we use the midpoint, okay? So now I have 11, which is something here. And for the third class, the midpoint is 1200 and the number of frequency is 23, which is here. After I finish from these, draw the line so i'm gonna draw the line between each dot why i have to do that because now i'm gonna understand the tendency of my data where it's going okay also if i have another set of data i could put it here and let's say for example like this so i can compare between these data by only looking to the uh, polygon. Okay. Hopefully it's clear. Now, last thing we will talk about it is com uh, cumulative frequency uh, distribution. So, cumulative. Um, <clears throat> the cumulative meaning uh, is uh, a success a successful editing. So, for example, let's say uh, if I have um, classes like here, okay, as you see here. So, the co community frequency for this classes is increasing by successive addition. What does that mean? So, this is my original classes, the profit and the frequency. Okay, so the let's see. Okay, so my first class here, the frequency is eight, and the second is eleven. If if we ask you what is uh, the community frequency for a profit less than hundred, for example, less than thousand. Okay, so thousand is here, and is eleven, but the question asks less than thousand, which means it also Considering the first class, I'm, so I'm gonna make a sum eight plus eleven. Okay, if you if the question asks you what is the cumulative frequency for uh, the profit less than six hundred, for example. Okay, this is the six hundred. So you will get a look how many frequency that you have less than six hundred, which is only eight. So you will gonna write it less than 600 equal to eight. Okay, now if the question asks you less uh, than thousand. Okay, this is thousand. So you're gonna make a sum of the previous uh, class, which is uh, eight plus 11, okay, which is going to be 19. If the question asks you uh, about a list than, let's say, 1,000, 
Okay, 800. So you're gonna look to here. Where is, uh, let's see. So I have to add it eight plus 11 to plus three plus 38. So 11 plus uh, eight plus 11 plus 23 plus 38, which is gonna be 80. If you sum and so on. So whenever the question asks you to find um, a cumulative frequency for any class, make a sum of this class and the previous one. As you see here, less than 3,400. So it's making sum of all the previous, it's making sum of all the previous uh, classes, which is all of these. So you're gonna make a sum of all of your uh, frequencies, and then you will end up with the number of your data, which is 180. Okay, so as you see, it's making some eight plus 11 plus 23, 20, and so on. This is the community frequency. Whenever it asks you about finding uh, less than this number, you have to add this, uh, this class to the previous classes, okay? As you see here, this is the community frequency uh, polygon for a profit on beta saw last month. Okay, as you did like this. So this is the end of, uh, end of the chapter two. And uh, hopefully it's clear. And we'll move to chapter three. Uh, okay. Uh, let's move to chapter three. Uh, chapter three is about measures of location, and we're going to discover these topics. So, first of all, what is measures of, of location? What is the definition for that? So, measures of location, it's a value used to describe the central tendency of the set of data. The central tendency which means if I have my data, one, two, three, uh, let's say six, uh, seven, ten. So usually these describe the central tendency of this data. Okay, so uh, there are common measures of location, uh, which is mean, median, mode, weighted me and we're gonna go through each one um, more deeply so first starting with me uh, me uh, in population is uh, sum of all the values in the population divided by the number of values in the population so me we uh, we say um, uh, mu, which is represented the population mean. So this one letter is called mu, which is a Greek lowercase letter. Okay, so m uh, mu is equal to sigma x divided by n. Sigma x, which is mean the sum of x value in the population. So if I have a population. Uh, like a population has a data one, two, six, seven, ten, and so on. So, sigma x, okay, it's mean you have to make a sum for all of these data. So, one plus two plus six plus seven plus ten, and so on. Okay, so sigma x mean you have to make a sum of these numbers that you have. Uh, and n is the number of this data. For example, here, one, two, three, four, five. Let's say I have four. So it's the number of this data. So any measurement, any measurable characteristic of a population is called parameter. So what is the parameter is a measurable characteristic of a population. You may see this uh, question in the exam ask you, uh, what is the measurable characteristic of a population? Or it's, maybe it's come with like multiple choice. So you have to memorize it as a parameter. 
also the mean of population is a good example of a parameter. Okay. Uh, let's start with this example. Uh, population mean counted. So in this example, it said there are 42 exits in uh, in I-75 through the state of Kentucky. Listed below are the distances between exit in miles. Okay, so the total exit in this road is uh, is 42. And the data that are giving, they are 42. If you count them, one, two, three, four, they are 42. Okay, so since this is the question, give me all the number of data. So this is population. It's not a sample because it's giving me the all numbers of all exit. Okay, so why this information is a population? Because we are considering all the all of the exits in Kentucky. So uh, it didn't skip any exit. So that's why it's a population. Now, the question asks, what, uh, what is the mean number of mile between exits? So we have a formula of mile uh, of mean, which is mu equal to sigma x divided by n. And here, I'm gonna make a sum of all my data I'm going to make a sum of all my data, starting by 11th, plus 4, plus 10, plus 4, plus 9, and so on, until I reach plus 1. Okay, I'm going to divide it on the number of data, which is 42. If you count the data, it will be 42. Then I'm going to make a, a sum, which will be equal to 292 divided by 42, which is my mean here is... 4.57 okay this is how i calculate my mean in a population okay hopefully it's clear by using the formula this one now what about sample mean sample mean which is you have to um, count the mean the mean for your sample uh, of data so mean is sum all of the uh, value in the sample divided by the number of values in a sample. So the formula we have here, x bar is equal to sigma x divided by n. So you have to understand that, do not go back to your population, just do your sample mean for your sample data, okay? So it's uh, x bar equal to sigma x divided by n. This is the sample mean. We call this sample mean. So the mean of sample or any other measure based on a sample data is called a statistic. <clears throat> okay, so statistic is a characteristic of a sample because we only conduct it with, uh, with a sample. If it is with population, population then we call this a parameter, okay? Now, measures uh, the uh, probabilities of arithmetic mean. Okay. Uh, the interval or ratio scale of measurement is required, numbers only. So, we use interval or ratio scale. Okay. Uh, you cannot uh, use uh, the nominal or ordinal scale here. Interval or ratio scale, that's it. All the data value are used in, cal in calculation. You cannot skip any data. You have to use all of your data. It's unique. Uh, the sum of the deviation from the mean equal to zero. Okay. So the sum of your deviation from the mean equal to zero. For example, I'm going to explain this. Uh, let's say I have uh, this data. One, three, four, seven, and ten. Okay, then uh, I ask you to find the mean. Okay, this is a sample. So your mean gonna be x bar equal to sum of x divided on n. Okay, so it's gonna be one plus three plus four plus seven plus 10 
divide it on the number of data one two three four five okay so it's gonna be uh, one uh, plus three four four plus four is eight eight plus seven uh, it's 15 15 plus 10 is 25 then x bar is equal to 5 okay so my mean here is uh, equal to x so this is the explanation for this part okay now uh, the deviation which is the differences between my number and the mean it's going to be, uh, we're going to calculate it first and then take the sum. If the sum is equal to zero, then this is the whole point. Let's try. So starting with my first, which is one minus, this is, uh, by the way, the defi uh, deviation it has a formula, which is uh, x minus x bar. This is the deviation formula. So it's gonna be starting from the first one. Uh, one minus five is equal to minus four. And then three minus five is equal to minus two. Four minus four, uh, five is equal to minus one. Seven minus five is equal to two. 10 minus 5 is equal to 5. Now, if you make a sum, okay, if you make a sum, let's say minus 4, minus 2, minus 1, plus 2, plus 5, you will see they are equal 0. Okay? If you make this sum, you will find they are equal to 0. Uh, minus 4, minus Two is minus six, minus seven, and then plus two is minus five, and then plus five is zero. So, from me, you have to understand the sum of deviation from the mean is equal to zero. This is a deviation. We make a sum for it, and the sum is equal to zero. This is the whole idea about uh, the mean. Also, there is a weakness part in mean. Get describe that here. So the weakness part from the mean that is affected by extreme value. For example, if I have uh, my data here, get describe this here. Oh. So for this one, if I have, let's say, this uh, whole set of data, two, four, uh, six, hundred, okay? Here my numbers are smaller, but here is a large number. So in mean, it will be affected by this extreme value. Okay, so my mean here is gonna, let's say, uh, x bar equal to plus, uh, divided by n, n is four, two plus, uh, four is six, plus six is 12, so it's gonna be 100, 12 um, divided 112 divided by 4 is equal to 28. See? So here my um, my mean is affected by it increases by the extreme value. Okay. Now let's move to the median. So median is the midpoint of the values after they have been ordering, ordered from the minimum to the maximum values. Okay, this is the median. First, you have to organize your data. Okay, you have to order your data and then take the midpoint of the values. If you have odd data, then you will find your mid only one, okay, only like one value. If you have even data, then you will have two value, okay, two value in the middle, okay. 
uh, we're gonna describe this example after this. So let's understand what is the characteristic of the median. The median is the value in the middle of set of ordered ada, data. It should be ordered. You cannot estimate your uh, median without ordering the data. At least the ordinary scale of measurement is required. At least the ordinary scale of measurement is required. So you could use ordinal uh, interval ratio, but you cannot use nominal here. It's not influenced by extreme value because you have to organize your data and then take the midpoint, which is um, won't be affected by the extreme value. 50% of the observation are larger than the median. Let's say if I have this example, if I have this data, one, uh, four, five, seven, and 10. Okay. They are uh, organized in order from the minimum to the maximum. Um, now I'm gonna search for the, mid, uh, the midpoint of this value. So I have one. And so this is my midpoint, which is five. Okay, so 50% of the observation are larger than the median, which is correct because I have here um, my data, I have my data, they are greater than five, which is the median. It's unique to a set of data. Uh, so this is the characteristic of the median. Let's practice this with exam. So now, uh, Find the median for an odd numbered data set. Okay. The number of hours as a sample of seven adults used uh, Facebook last month. Okay. So this is the number of hours. By the first adult, he used uh, Facebook for three hours. The other one used it for five hours, the other for five, hours, and so on. Okay. So now the data is not organized, so I have to organize them. I'm gonna start one, three, I will start from the minimum to the maximum, five and so on. Now I'm gonna search about the midpoint. I'm gonna move like two from here, two from here, and one from here. Then I find my midpoint, which is five. So the median here is five because I only have one value in the middle of my data. I have here three and here three. So this is my uh, midpoint of the data. Okay, what about if I have an even number of data? For example, let's take the same example with the 10 user, with the 10 adult that used Facebook last month. So as you see, the data is not organized. I have to organize my data. So I'm gonna start one, three, three, five, five, seven, nine, nine, ten, seventy. Okay. Then I'm gonna search about the midpoint. I'm gonna move from here three, three, and from here one, one. I found there is two, two of values in the middle. Okay, since there are two values in the middle, I'm gonna use um uh, I'm gonna take the average of these two middle points. I cannot say five, it's the midpoint, it's the median. Since they are two values, you have to take the median. So uh, they take the average value of these two middle value. So I'm gonna say five plus seven divided by two. So it's gonna be 12 divided by two, it's gonna be six. So, you have to take uh, the average of these two middle values, okay? Now, uh, the third, uh, the third uh, measurement is uh, called the mood. So the mood, the value of the observation that occur most frequently. The value of observation that occur most frequently. So, from this uh, graph, you can say Lamuro, okay, it's occur more frequently than the other because 
the graph is the highest one. Okay. Um, in numbers, for example, if you see this data, one, three, four, three, uh, six, seven, four, three, ten. Okay. And I ask you, okay, what is the mood from this data? First of all, you will have to find which number is more uh, more repeated than the other. I'm going to say here one, three. So I have three. Three is repeated three times. And also, I have four as a repeated, but four here is repeated like two times. So I'm not going to use it. So I have three repeated three times. So my mod here is equal to three. Okay. Also, let's say, for example, we have another number of, uh, of four. Okay, so four also repeated three times. So my mod here, it could be three and four. So if it's repeated uh, like the same, then I could take both of them as a my mod, a my mod. So you cannot, uh, choose only one. Now you can say we have two mod here. It's, uh, for example, here is three and four. Okay. Also, another another uh, characteristic about the mood can be found for nominal level, which is surprising. So nominal level data, which is labeled, if you see, let's say I took a sample for girl name. Okay. Let's say I have a uh, Let's say Amal. Let's say I have uh, Rana, okay, and Amal. Another uh, girl name Amal. Another one like called Summer, for example. And then I ask you, what is the mood from this? Uh, the mood from this data. You will see Amal. Amal name has repeated two two times, which is this is my mood. So mood, you can use it also in uh, uh, in nominal level of data, okay? So as we say, a set of data can have more than one mood and we uh, discover that through the, our example. Now, uh, we have something called relative position of mean, median, and mood, okay? The relative position, uh, this is important because you will see in the example ask you uh, what is the relative uh, position for uh, your answer, okay? So first, as you see here, if your mean and me, uh, media and mode, they are similar or they are equal each other, then we have a symmetric distribution. We have symmetric, it's called symmetric distribution, which means they are symmetric, both sided, they equal each other, okay? Now, if you have, let's say, your mean greater than your median, greater than your mood, okay? If you have this, reach this conclusion, then you have a positively squared distribution. It's called the positively squared distribution. Because in some example, you will have from the data I get, you have to answer for mean, median, and mood, okay? So after you did that, and then compare the numbers that you have, I will ask you which, uh, which relative position of them. And then you will see if the mean greater than the median, greater than the mood, then it's positively squeezed. If your data, the mean and median and mood, they are equal to each other, then you could say they are symmetric distribution. Here, lastly, if you reach the conclusion that your mood greater than your median, greater than your mean, okay, that's mean you have a negatively squared distribution. Okay, that's how mean you have a negatively squared distribution. Uh, last uh, thing we're going to talk about it uh, in the measurement is 
the weighted mean. The weighted mean is founded by multiplying each observation x by each corresponding weight w. What's that mean? So if you have an observation and each observation that you have has its own weight, okay? So now you are gonna use another formula which is called weighted, uh, weighted mean. When you have to multiply each observation by its corresp uh, corresponding and then make a sum of all of that. And we can say there is a shortcut for this formula. It's going to be x bar in w is equal to the sigma of wx uh, divided by sigma x. Okay, it's going to be as we discovered before plus w2 x2 and so on divided by w1 plus w2 and so on. Okay, so note that the denominator of weighted mean is always the sum of the weight. The denominator is always the sum of the weight. We're gonna see this in an example. See, uh, the Carter Construction Company paid its hourly employee. Um, they have different um, different paid. So they have $16.5 and or $19 or $25 per hour. Okay, so this they have different uh, different paying uh, amount. So there are 26 hourly employee. Okay, the total of their employee is uh, 26. Four of them are paid at 16.5 hour rate. 10 of them paid at 19, uh, paid at 19 uh, dollar rate, and two of them get paid at 25 rate. What is the mean hourly rate paid for the 26 employees? So here, each number or each um, each uh, amount, each dollar, it, it's different to if you say 14, for example, are paid at the 16. So you're gonna multiply 14 by 16 and make a sum, 10 multiplied by 19, also make a sum, two multiplied by 25, and then you're gonna uh, divide it by the number of people. So let's make this clear. So I'm going to start here. So 14, which is the employee that are to pay, uh, they, uh, they are get paid at 16.5 plus 10, which is they are get paid at 19 rate. And the two plus two, they get paid at the 25. I'm going to make a sum of all the denominator, which is going to be four, uh, 471. And I'm gonna divide it by the 26, which is the number of all the employee, okay? And then I have uh, my weighted mean is 18.1154, uh, okay, dollar. So this is the weighted mean for this employee in this company. Now we have this example. Uh, so this here is information about five stocks. Stock A, B, C, D, A. And the share price for each stock, for example, A has a $5, B, $7, C, and so on. Number of shares, which is gonna be my W here, and here my X. Number of shares is 200,000. Uh, 200, and 120,000, 150,000, and here 100,000, and here is 80,000. Okay, so I'm gonna starting by using uh, the weight mean, the weighted mean formula because the question asks, what is the weighted mean of stock prices? And round your answer to the nearest hundred. So I'm gonna write my formula. 
weighted mean equal to which is x bar it's equal to xw w okay which is x1 multiply by w1 plus x2 uh, uh, multiply by w2 and so on until divided by w1 plus w2 and so on okay so i'm gonna apply my data from the table i'm gonna apply my data from the table to this formula so it's gonna be okay five uh, times 200,000 plus seven times, let's say, okay, plus 10, uh, okay, plus tw uh, 20, Okay, plus 12 multiplying by, okay, four, okay. So this is all my numerator. I'm, I'm writing in detail just to make sure you understand the idea. So it's divided by plus, okay plus 100,000 plus 80, okay, plus 80. So now it's going to be, after I done with all the calculation, it's going to be um, uh, 630,000 divided by, uh, sorry, six, okay, so it's going to be, uh, yes, it's going to be six, uh, 630,000 divided, okay, here for zero, okay, divided by six, uh, by 650,000, okay. So after you did the division, it's going to be $9.69, okay? From where I get this, from the table, I took my information from here, I applied to my formula, then I got the weighted mean of stock prices, which is $9.69, okay? Another example, uh, a hospital in Bluey, 200 person on the nursing staff. So how many, how many nurse, uh, nurses I have is 200, okay? So 50 are nurse helper and 50 are, here 50, 50 pra uh, practical nurses and 100 are registered nurses. A nurse helper receive a dollar an hour per hour, and a practical nurse receive fifteen dollar an hour, and the registered nurse receive twenty four uh, per uh, per hour. So, what is the weight? The mean hourly wage, okay, which is the pay. So, I'm gonna start first by uh, identify. Uh, what is um, what is my W and X? So my X here is the paid hourly, the amount that for paid um, uh, hourly, and W here is uh, the person or the people. Okay, nurse. Okay, now let's write my formula. 
weighted mean is equal to x bar which is equal to sigma x w divided by w so it's gonna be okay uh, i have 50 which is they are get per eight dollar per hour okay plus also i have 50 they get 15 per hour and i have um uh, hundred and they get paid by 24 per hour and divided by the number of nurses which is 200 so it's going to be after you're done with the calculation it's going to be 300 3550 divided by 200 which is going to be 1775 so the mean uh, the mean uh, the weighted mean hourly is going to be 177 uh, 17.75 dollar per hour okay so this this is uh, the type of uh, question if they ask you about the weighted mean. Now, we're going to talk about dispersion measures. So the dispersion, uh, the dispersion in is the variation or separate in set of data. Okay, so this is the basic idea about the dispersion, which is the variation or separate in a set of data. So let's now uh, introduce the range. So what, are, what is the range? The range of data, if I say uh, my data has a, a range and I ask you to calculate this range, how we can do that? So the range is the differences between the maximum and minimum value in a set of data, okay? And it has own formula. The formula is take the maximum value and subtract it from the minimum value. Okay, for example, let's say I have this data, 3, 4, 6, 10, 15, 18, okay? And I, um, I ask you to find the range of this data. So you're going to take the lowest uh, value, which is a, a 3, and the maximum value, which is 18. So you're going to say 18 minus 3 is equal to 15. So my range here is 15. Okay. Now, the measure characteristic of the range are only two values are used in this calculation. As I said, is the subtract between the maximum value and the minimum value. So I haven't, or I, I, I won't use any of these data. So that it only used the max, the minimum and the maximum, which is only the two values, okay? It also, it influences by extreme values, okay? Since you are um, subtract the maximum value from the minimum value, it's influenced because if you, if you have like a large number in the maximum and a small number in the minimum, so the difference is here is much bigger. It's easy to compute and to understand. You can uh, understand your range. Uh, if, you, if I ask you about the range, you, you will get the, the idea what I mean, because you will know from this data, my range is started from 3 to 18, and the, the long or the range for me is 15, after I done the calculation. So the interval here is start from 3 to 18, and the range of this interval uh, is 15, okay? So it's easy to understand. Variance. So variance is, uh, is a measure of uh, dissipation, meaning it's a measure of how far a set of number is separated out from their average value. For example, uh, which is the average value here, we talk about mean. 
So if I have a data, let's say three, four, six, seven, ten, and I told you the mean, the mean of this data is five. So the variance will address how far each value that I have from the mean. For example, three here is uh, minus two far from the mean, which is negative, uh, below, below the mean. Four is minus one, which is below the mean uh, by one. Six is uh, positive one, which is above the mean. So this is the variance. It's to describe how far uh, a set of number is separated out from the mean, okay? So it's measured the mean amount by which value in population or sample vary from their mean, okay? So uh, the characteristic of the values are the observation are used in all the observation that you have all the frequency, all the data, you have to use it in calculation. You cannot skip any data. The units are somewhat difficult to work with. They are the original unit square. Okay, so if you have a unit, okay, we're gonna uh, use the original unit square. I'm gonna describe that in an example. So variance, I have two, um, I have two uh, formulas. One formula is for, for population and the other formula is for variance. So for population, I have um, a sigma square is equal to sigma x minus mu uh, to the power two divided by n. Okay, so as you see here, uh, mu here, is the mean okay and n is the number of uh, observation in in the population uh, also this is the mean of uh, mu is the mean of population uh, so now you can calculate the values by using this formula the formula for sample variation okay so uh, we call it S square is equal to sigma x minus uh, x bar to the power two divided by n minus one. So here x bar is the sample mean. Okay, is the sample mean, and it has own formula. Okay, now n minus one, you will take the number of data that you have and subtract it from one. You can use this formula only for sample variance. Okay. Let's see some example in sample variance. As I say, this is a sample variance, so we have to use the second formula. So the hour, uh, the hourly wages for a sample of five part-time employees at Home Depot. So 12, 20, 60, and 90 and uh, 18 and 90. Okay, so now uh, I'm gonna write down first the formula of sample variance. So the formula of sample variance is S square equal to sigma x minus x bar to the power of two divided by n minus one. So this is the sample variance formula. I write it down and then I'm still missing um, x bar, which is the sample mean. So x bar is equal to uh, sum of x divided by n, okay? So my x is here is 12 plus 20 plus 60 plus 18 plus 19, which is from here. So divided. One, two, three, four, five, divided by four. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna make a sum of the denominator. 12 plus 20 plus 16 plus 18 plus 19, which is 85 uh, divided 
by 5, which is 17. Okay. Uh, I calculate the x bar. So my sample mean here is 17. And this is how I calculate it. Now, after I done with calculating the sample mean, I'm going back to my uh, sample variance uh, uh, formula. So it's going to be, okay, it's going to be is uh, square, okay, uh, x minus x bar, so it's going to divide it by n minus 1, okay? So the total number of that I have, they are 5. So now I found here n is equal to 5. Too small, so n equal to 5. Okay, this is from the data. Now I construct this, uh, this table to make my data organized. So, first I'm gonna say this is my axis. Okay, now I'm gonna subtract each one of my axes from the mean, which is x bar. So, I'm gonna say uh, here. So I'm going to say first x is which is 12. So 12, say here, just one second. Okay, let's say 12 minus 17, which is equal to um, minus 5, minus 17. Okay, what is the 17 here? It's x bar. Okay, so this one is to find x bar. I'm going to subtract each of my x's to x bar. So 20 minus 17, 3, 60 minus 17, minus 1, and so on. Okay, now see, you, we find out the deviation here equal to 0. Because the deviation, uh, each, um, each x's or each uh, data, uh, the deviation from the sum of their uh, deviation is equal to zero. Uh, equal to zero. This is when we uh, describe the example uh, in mean. So the deviation here is called deviation. The sum of the de uh, deviation is equal to zero. Okay. Now after I done the uh, the first step, second step I'm gonna all the squares. So I'm gonna say minus five. Square is equal to 25. Uh, 3 squared is 9. Minus 1 is uh, 1. 1 is 1. 2 is 4. Okay. And then I'm going to make a sum of that. So it's going to be 40. Okay. So this is my answer that I wanted to reach. And then I'm going to apply this in my formula. So it's going to be 4 over 5 minus 1. It's going to be 4 over 4, which is equal to 10. Okay, so 10 is uh, the hourly age for these people. Okay, hopefully it's clear. Uh, what I recommend for that, try to memorize the steps, create your table, then you can organize your work. We can discover this in more example, but first let's talk about uh, the standard deviation. Okay, standard deviation looks uh, at how to spread out a group of number is from the mean by looking at the square root of the variance. So the the variance equation that we have learned is equal to okay the sum of the deviation squared divided by n minus 1. Okay, this is the, uh, this is called the variance. Okay, this is the variance equation. Now, standard deviation is looking by take the root square. Okay, and then it's become s, this one's going to with square, it's going to be divided by n minus 1. Okay, so this is called standard deviation. 
the formula is looks uh, similar to the variance, but it will uh, you have to take the square root for both sides, and then this is called standard deviation. Okay, so it's here is the sample standard deviation. We call we represent that by s, and x here it's uh, the mean, obviously, and n is the number of the observation in this sample. Okay, now let's talk about the measure characteristic of the standard deviation. Uh, it's on the same unit as original data. So if your data, for example, is uh, a scientist, then your uh, standard deviation will be a size also. If it is number, it will be a number. So it's the same uh, as your original data. Is the square root of the average uh, square distance from the mean, which is mean the values. It cannot be negative, of course, because we have a uh, power of two. So usually we do have a negative. Uh, it's the most widely used measure of dispersion. So this one is the most common tool uh, people use to count uh, the dispersion in the data. Okay. The other topic is called sample mean of group data. Okay, sample mean of group data. Uh, it's, uh, it has this formula, x bar is equal to sigma f multiplied by m and uh, divided by n. So m here is uh, the midpoint. The midpoint of each class. Midpoint of each class, which means uh, you have to take, okay, the started of the class, the started of the class plus the end of the class divided by two. So to find your midpoint, uh, take the first of your class, uh, make a sum of the uh, second point in your class and divide it by two. Okay, so this is the formula for sample mean of group data. Uh, when we're gonna use that, we're gonna use that in grouped data. If you have the question ask about group data, so you can apply uh, this uh, formula of mean, okay? Now let's say, in this example, okay? The question asks, calculating the standard, uh, the standard deviation of group data. As you see here, the question is mentioned, this is a group data, okay? This is our example from Upload or to group uh, company. So now, Okay, I have these classes, which is we classified last uh, last last lecture. So my interval here start from two hundred dollars and then in six uh, and then uh, with six hundred dollars. This is my first interval. Second, I was first class. Second class started with six hundred, ended in one thousand. Okay, so now. I'm gonna see the frequency for each uh, class, which we determined last lecture. Now, today we're gonna have to find first the midpoint. So to calculate the standard deviation, first, you have to find the midpoint, okay? So the midpoint here, we're gonna uh, calculate that by taking the first uh, of each class and the last of each class and divide it by two. So from here, I'm gonna say 200 plus 600 divided by two, it's gonna 800, okay? So this is my midpoint for the first class, which is 400. To calculate, uh, the midpoint for the second class, I'm going to take 600 and 1,000 divided by 2, so it's going to be 800. Okay, and do it for the rest. So we have to do it for all the rest. So, and then we reach uh, 3,200, okay? 
after we've done this calculation. So done with the first column. Second column, you have to multiply each frequency by the midpoint. You have to multiply each frequency with the midpoint. So this has become, after you do multiplication, you multiply eight times 400, it's gonna be 3,211 times, uh, 11 times 800, it's gonna be 8,800 and so on. So do it for all of them as a multiplication. After you're done from this column, now you are able to find your sample mean. Okay, after you're done with this, from step, uh, step one and two, now you can find your sample mean. So what is the formula for sample mean as we discovered it here? Okay, it's, okay, sample mean. Okay, of course, of a group of data, x bar is equal to uh, sum of uh, the multiplication of uh, frequency and midpoint divided by n. So my n here, which is the number of frequency, 180. Okay, now the sum Okay, the sum of the, the multiple, which is here, is 3. Okay, from where I find this one, after I done the multiplication here, I'm going to make a sum of, the, of them. Okay, so after I done the multiplication, I'm going to automatically. Okay, I'm going to make a sum. Okay. And then it's going to be, uh, here it's going to be, after you do the uh, division, it's going to be 3, let's say 3, 200 divided by, it's going to be uh, 1,851. I'm going to round it to the nearest whole number. So it's going to be, okay. Uh, 100, 1851. So this is my x bar, which is the sample mean. After I found that, I'm going to write it here. x bar is equal to, okay. So done with that, now I'm going to do the third step, which is I have to take, uh, to do the subtraction between the midpoint and uh, the mean, okay. So three, it's me, subtract midpoint and uh, me, ensemble me, okay, ensemble me. So now I will subtract each number. So let's say I have 400, okay, 400 minus uh, 1,051, it will be equal to minus 1,451, okay? Again, I'm gonna also subtract the second midpoint from my x bar, which is the sample me. So I'm gonna end up with 1,051, and I will do it for the rest, okay? So this is step three. So remember, first step, find the midpoint. Okay, so first step, find the midpoint. Second step, do the multiplication, the, uh, multiply the frequency by the midpoint. Third step, uh, find the deviation, which is the midpoint, uh, subtract the midpoint from the mean, okay? And fourth step only, so first step only do uh, only square. So first square, okay. So I'm gonna say uh, 1451 uh, square, it's gonna equal to this number, and this one equal to this number. So just make a square for all my data here in the deviation. 
last step here last step here all you what you have to do is just take the frequency and multiply by the square okay so here multiply 4 by the frequency to find 5 okay and then after you've done that make a sum of this data here is the sum so make a sum of this data and then use your um, standard deviation of group data so standard deviation which is s equal to sigma f uh, multiplied by m minus x bar square divided by n minus one so it's gonna under the square root and my data here is uh, n equal to 180 i'm gonna subtract from one so it's gonna be 652.33 um, okay so you have to uh, organize your work by looking to your table find uh, the variable that you want and follow your uh, formula okay now for question two i have a set of data uh, which is the, num the number of daily reported cases of influenza at local kids daycare okay now uh, first we have to find a sample mean uh, from this data okay so i'm gonna use the sample mean formula which is x bar equal to sum of x divided by n which is by the way here uh, n is i think is nine one yeah nine one two three four five six seven eight nine so my n here is equal to nine okay so i'm gonna say five plus five plus five plus six seven eight sorry nine plus twelve divided by nine so it's equal to seven okay this is the sample mean uh what is the median okay in median i have first to organize my data let me look here so my my data here is organized so i'm gonna say one here's three and here's three data so this one okay so here then the median so the median is equal to six now what is the mud the mud I'm going to look through which number is repeated more frequently. So as I say here, uh, number five are repeated three times. So my mode here equal to five. Okay, now let me try out. So five, okay. So I find my mean, which is seven, medium six, and mod is five. Uh, question number D, based on the value of uh, arithmetic mean, uh, median, and mod, what is the most likely shape of distribution? So as I see here, my median or my mean is greater than median. greater than mood so then the distribution okay is positively squid okay it's positively squid as you see here this is the positively squid okay this is the positively squid because my median, my mean is larger than median than mod. Okay. Now, E, find the sample various and round your answer to the nearest step. So to find the same sample variance, first, 
I have to find the deviation, okay? And find the square of the deviation. First, what is the formula for the variance? It's S, uh, yeah, S square is the sum of a sigma, which is sum of the deviation square divided by N minus one. Okay, now I'm gonna first organize the table. I'm gonna say here X, X minus X bar, which is deviation, okay? And I'm gonna make a square of my deviation. Okay, so I'm gonna first organize my data, which is five, 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 six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I'm gonna say here total. Okay, now you already calculate the mean, okay, from D. Now, from I think A. Okay, my mean is six, uh, seven, sorry. So mean is seven, this is from A. Okay, now let's uh, calculate the deviation. So I'm, I have here five. So five minus seven, five, okay, minus seven, which is my mean, it's gonna be the correct it's gonna be minus two also five minus seven minus two minus two and now six minus seven it's gonna be minus one minus one and seven minus seven which is zero eight minus seven one and nine minus seven two three or five okay if you make a sum of the deviation it should be zero this is this is by uh, uh, by default because the sum of the deviation from mean is zero. Okay. Now let's make a square of each deviation. So it's going to be four, 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 one, one, zero, one, four, twenty-five. So the sum of uh, all the square a deviation is 44. To make a sum, 4 plus 4, 4 plus uh, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 25 equal to 45. Okay, now back to our formula. So I'm going to say the sum of my square uh, root um, of my square of the deviation is 45. Okay, divided on 7 minus 1 is not 7, 10. Okay, divided by uh, 9 minus 1 is equal to 41.8, which is equal to 5.5. Okay, so my variance, my variance here is 5.5. Okay, question number two. Uh, 10 random chosen students were asked how many times they had missed class during a certain semester. The answer were as following. Now, they said randomly chosen students. I'm gonna say how many how many students they used. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So my in here is ten. Okay, remember that my in here is ten. Okay. So now, what is the sample mean? Okay. What is the sample mean? I'm going to say x bar equal to x over n, which is I'm going to make a sum of all my data. Okay, 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 divided by 10. And it's going to be 4. So this is my mean. So what is the median? I'm going to look to all of my data to find if they are organized, then I'm gonna to find the middle point. So here from here four, so I'm gonna from here four. So I have two values. Then I'm gonna take uh, the average of these values. 
So media is equals uh, 3 plus 3 divided by 2, 6 is equal to 3. Okay, so my median here is 3. So what is the mod? I'm going to see here to the mod. Uh, which number is repeated more frequently? So from observation, it's 1. So moon is equal to 1. Okay, now D, based in the value of the mean, median, and mode, what is the most likely shape of the distribution? As you see here, and lay out here my mean, uh, mean and median and mode. So from the observation, I'm going to say 4 is greater than 3, greater than 1. So here, mean greater than median greater than mod okay so this said the distribution is positively squid uh, this is from the Early of our lecture, when we describe how the distributions depended on the mean and mode and uh, uh, median. Okay, so now, as you see here, my mean is greater than my median than mode. Now, E is asked you to find the sample, uh, the sample variance. Okay. Question ask about the sample variance and round your answer to the nearest standard. First, from uh, from question A, okay, from A, x bar is equal to 4, okay, equal to 4. And we're going to organize my data. So let's say um, I have x. The deviation which is x minus x bar and then the square x minus x bar square okay uh, i'm gonna organize my data one one uh, let's say my data one okay one one three 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 Seven, uh, let's say seven, nine, eleven, and total. Okay. Stay here. Total. Okay. Now, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna sub uh, subtract uh, each x from the mean. 1 minus 4, so, uh, minus 3, uh, 1 minus 4, minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, and then, okay, and then I'm going to say here, uh, 3 minus, sorry, 3 minus 4 minus 1, okay, and 7 minus uh, 4, 3, 9 is 5, and 11, 7. Okay, and the total of these should be 0. So let's make sure. Okay, minus 3. Okay. Minus uh, 3. Okay, which is it's minus 15. If you make a sum of these, it's going to be minus 15, and this is going to be positive 15, then it's going to be zero. So my answer is correct. Oh, now I make sure this is the deviation. It's zero from the mean. Now I'm going to make a square of the deviation. So this is going to be 9, 9, 9, 9, 1, 1, 1, and this is going to be 9. 
five is gonna be 25 and seven is gonna be 49. So I'm gonna make a sum all of these. So I have nine plus nine plus uh, three plus 25. So it's gonna be 122, okay? Then with them, I'm done now from my schedule, from my table. So I'm gonna use the Faris equation, which is um, S square, okay, sigma uh, of uh, my deviation, which is the R square divided by A minus one. Okay, now this, the sum of X uh, minus x bar square, which is we found it 100, 100. Sorry, it's not 100. So here is 2. Okay, so so it's going to be 122 divided by n minus, uh, which is 10. So it's going to 9. So it's going to be 13. 56 and here also the information n is equal to 10. Okay, so this is how to find the variance and uh, the sample variance. Okay, now this question is asked. Okay, uh, also how to find a sample uh, variance of monthly cost. So we're going to use the same uh, procedure. The question said, a sample of 20 color students was asked how much they spent monthly on cell phone plan. So the data is grouped in the following frequency distribution table. So here it's a group data. So let's say first class, okay, is between $20 or $30. This is my first class. Second class is between $30 and $40 and so on, okay? And the frequency for the first class is nine, for the second is four and so on, okay? The total of frequency, 20, okay? Now, first, I have to find the class midpoint. Okay, let me change the color. Okay, the class midpoint, how I can find that? I'm going to go to the classes, take the end, uh, the start and the end point, make a sum and divide by two. So it's going to be 50 by two, which is 25. So the first class midpoint is 25. Okay. The second, I'm going to take the second the class I have. Make a sum of the start and end point divided by two. So it's going to be 70 divided by two, which is 35. And I'm um, repeat all the process for each class. Then I'm going to have 45, 55, and 65. If you repeat it, you will find the same answer. Okay. This is my first column. Second column, I have to multiply each frequency by class midpoint. So I'm gonna say nine times 25 is 225. Four times 35 is gonna be 140. This is only multiplication. So three times 45, it's going to be 135, 2 times 55 is going to be 110, uh, 2 times uh, 65 is going to 130. And make a sum of this data, so it's going to be 740, okay? Now, uh, now I'm going to start to, to, uh, to count the deviation. Okay, which is my third step. But before I count my deviation, I don't have X bar, which is the mean, the sample mean. So I'm gonna first find the sample mean 
of the monthly cost. So go back to B, which is the answer. So it's going to be X bar equal, and we're going to use the formula, which is the, uh, the sigma FM divided by N. What is sigma FM? Is the sum of the uh, frequency multiplied by midpoint. So here is the sum we found in the area, which is 740 divided by the number of observation, which is 20. And then it's going to be 37 dollars. Okay. Okay, this is the sample mean. Now I'm going to take, okay. I'm going to take each uh, midpoint, each midpoint, and subtract it from my uh, mean. So for the first one, it's going to be here. It's going to be 25, as you see, 25 minus 37, which is will be minus 12. Okay, second one. It's going to be 35 minus 37, which is 72. Okay, and so on. So these, the 25 and 35, uh, they are from the midpoint. The third midpoint, which is 45 minus 37, and it's going to be 8, and so on. Okay, so... And then for the other one is 18 and 20, 28. So it's important to understand how we calculate this. Okay, the fourth column only make a square for each uh, value in the third column. So it's going to be 145, it's going to be 4. Uh, 8 squared is going to be 64, and 18 squared is going to be 324, and it is 784. Okay, we're done from the step 4. Now, step 5, I'm going to multiply each frequency by the square of the deviation. So, I'm going to take this and multiply by this. So, it's going to be First, 9 times 145, 44, it's going to be 100, 1,296. Okay, now 5 times 4, oh sorry, 4 times 4 is going to be 16. This is the number of frequency. And so on. So I'm going to do it for the rest. But just make sure you understand how we get there. So the total of these, I'm going to make a sum. And the total is going to be 3,720. Okay. So now the question asks to find the sample variance, uh, uh, variance for uh, the monthly cost. So I'm going to use uh, the equation for the variance, which is, sorry. Okay. F times n minus x, which is the square of the variation, divided by n minus 1. So we already calculated the denominator, which is here. So it's going to be 3, 7, 2, 0, divided by 20 minus 1. So it's going to be over 19. So it's going to be 195. Point seventy nine. So this is the variance of monthly cost. Okay. So now we reach the uh, the variance of the monthly cost. Okay. Hopefully it's clear. Uh, if there is a misunderstanding, just email me. Now, question eight. The last question. Consider the below monthly cost of electricity uh, for 20 house located in the same neighborhood during December. The data is grouped in the following frequency distribution table. 
Okay. There is many. Uh, there is uh, one, two, three, four, five. There is a five classes for the data. So first class is started from eighty-five dollars up to ninety-five dollars. So from this class, I have to find the class midpoint. Okay. So the class midpoint here, I'm gonna take the starting point, which is eighty-five plus ninety-five, which is the end point, divided by two. And this is going to be uh, 90. This is for the first class. Okay, so this one is going to be 90. Second class, you will, go, you will do the same. Okay, so we're going to say 95 plus 100, uh, 5 divided by 2. So it's going to be 100. Okay. And so on. So I'm going to do the class midpoint for each class. Okay. Okay. Done with the first column. Okay. Second column, I'm going to multiply. Okay. I'm going to multiply each frequency by the midpoint. Okay. So now I'm going to say two times uh, 90 which is 180, four times 100 is 400, and seven times 110, it's gonna be 770, and so on. So I'm gonna do it, um, okay, times 600, okay. Now I'm gonna make a sum of this data, which is gonna be 2,240. Okay, now for the fourth, for the third column, okay, I'm going to use the median, but I haven't found the median yet. So I'm going to first calculate the median before I process, uh, pursue to the uh, column, uh, to the column three. So I'm going to say mean, it will be x bar is equal to k divided by n m is the midpoint which is calculated here so it's going to be 2240 divided by n and my n here is 20 okay so it's going to be 112 okay so this is my x bar so I'm going to write it here, x bar is equal 112. Okay, now I'm going to subtract each midpoint from um, the x bar, which is uh, the sample mean. So now 90 subtract 112, it's going to be minus 22. Okay, now 100 minus 112. Okay, so it's going to be uh, minus 12. Okay, and so on. So I'm going to do it for the rest. Okay, so you have to subtract the midpoint from the, um, the mean. Okay, now I'm going to make all the square for each uh, data on column for a uh, three. So for it's all the square, so it's going to be 22. Uh, square is going to be 484, uh, uh, and then 12 square is going to be 144, and 2 square is 4, 8 square is 64, 64, and 18 square is 324. Okay, now I only make, a, uh, I only here make a square. Now for the last column, Okay, for the last column, I only multiply four by the frequency. Okay, I only multiply four by the frequency. I'm gonna make it for the cut. So I only multiply four by the frequency. Okay, so two times 484, it's gonna be 90, uh, 900, 968. Okay. Now, 4 times 144 is going to be 576. 
okay? And seven times four is 28 and so on. So I'm gonna do it for the rest. Okay, and then six, 20, okay? Now I'm gonna make a sum of this data, okay? I'm gonna make a sum and then it's gonna be 3,320, okay? This is how we calculate the data. So the last question asks, find the sample variance, okay? So what's the formula for the sample variance? So it's gonna be, okay, sigma f, n minus x bar squared divided by n minus one. Okay, we found the numerator, which is b b two zero from here. We divided n minus one, which is ninety. We have uh, n equal to twenty. This is gonna be hundred seventy four. Okay, which is the monthly cost. Okay, this is um, how to find the variance by completing uh, your table. I also recommend using this table because it will organize your work and it's become easier to you, okay? So uh, this is the end of chapter three. And thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully you understand everything and good luck in your quiz. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, today we're gonna talk about chapter four. Uh, in chapter four, we're gonna talk about uh, describing data. We're gonna talk about uh, displaying and exploring data. Uh, we're gonna cover these topics. First, we're gonna talk about uh, construct and interrupt uh, a data blot, and how also to construct and describe uh, stem and link display. We're gonna talk about measures of position. Also, we're gonna construct and analyze uh, a box blot. Also, we're going to talk about uh, coefficient of sequences. Uh, also, uh, also, we're going to talk about scatter diagram and contingency table. Okay, now, quick reminder of the previous chapter. Um, in chapter two, uh, two we, talk, uh, we talked about uh, the subjective statistic, uh, how we uh, organize our data, how we can visualize it, um, also, uh, how we can distinguish the general shape of the data. Chapter three, we talked about uh, measures of location uh, and also uh, how we can uh, find the mean and median and mod. Now, in this chapter, we're gonna continue our study of descriptive statistic. Uh, we're gonna study data plots, percentilize uh, books of uh, plots, uh, and hopefully they will be enjoyable topics. So first of all, we're gonna talk about uh, dot plots. So dot plot summarize the distribution of one variable by sticking dots at points in a number line that shows the value of, all the, uh, of the variables. So a dot plot show all values. So remember, it's important here, you cannot skip any data. You have to show all of your data. If you're trying to uh, present your data through a data plot, so then you have to show all of your data. You cannot skip the data because this is the, the aim of using data blood is to show all of your data. Now, how we can construct um, data blood uh, and using data? I'm gonna start by showing, uh, showing you the video to make it easier to you. So, and then we're gonna apply what we have learned from the video to our example. Let's start. In this video, we're going to focus on making frequency tables and dot plots. So let's begin by writing a list of a few numbers. So let's say we have the numbers 5, 8, 3, 6, 8, 5, 8, 2, 3, 8, 5, 8, 3, 5, 7, 6. First, let's make a frequency table. So we're going to need two columns. The first one is going to be the value. The second one is going to be the frequency. And let's start with the lowest value. The lowest value is two. Now, how many twos do we have in our list? 
there's only one. So the frequency for that number is one. Now the next highest number is a three. And we have one, two, three threes in the list. Now we don't have a four, so we're gonna move on to a five. And we have one, two, three, four fives in this example. The next number is a six, and we have one, two sixes. And it looks like we have one seven. And finally, the last number that we have is an eight. One, two, three, four, five eights. So that's how you can make a frequency table. So now let's convert this frequency table into a dot plot. So let's begin by making a number line. And let's start with our lowest value, which is two. And then let's go up to our highest value in order up to eight. Now we're gonna place a dot above each number that we have. The number of dots will correspond to the frequency that we see here. So we have one, two, so let's put one dot above a two. And we have three threes, so we're gonna put three dots above the number three. We have five, I mean four fives. So one, two, three, four. We have two six, one seven, and five eights. And so that is how you can make a dot plot. Now, looking at the dot plot, what number in our list is the mode? The mode is the number with the highest frequency, in this case, with the greatest number of dots. So eight is the mode in this example. Now, what number is the median? So we gotta find the middle number in the list. We could eliminate the first five dots on the right and the first five dots on the left. Then if we eliminate one on the right, one on the left, another one on the right, another one on the left, there's two left over. So the median is gonna be the average of five and six. So in this example, the median is 5.5. Now, for the sake of practice, let's construct another dot plot. Now, uh, for the remainder, remaining of the video, uh, it's just showing you, uh, you don't have always to construct the frequency table. You can, from your data, uh, construct the data plot without starting with the frequency table. Okay, let's see how you can do it without frequency table. So let me give you a list of numbers, 7, 4, 9, 3, 9, 5, 9, 7, 3, 9, 3, 9, 5, 8. So use this information, go ahead and make the dot plot. Don't worry about the frequency table. Feel free to pause the video and try it. that line is not straight. So the lowest number that we have in this example is a three. And the highest number is a nine. So we have one, two, three threes in this example. And we have one, only one four. And we have one, two fives. And I don't see any sixes. Now we have one, two sevens. So let's put two dots for that. And we only have one eight. And we have one, two, three, four, five nines.
So we can clearly see that nine is the mode in this example. But that's OK. So now, as you see, uh, as you saw, um, we can construct uh, the delta plot without using frequency table. But is the procedure will be messy. So that's why I always recommend to start with your uh, frequency table. But if you prefer to do it with that, without uh, using the frequency table, it's up to you. Uh, let's see how, how we can do the same in this example. So now I have this example. Uh, the question said use the tablet to compare the two data set like this uh, of the number of vehicle service last month for two different dealership. So uh, the first dealership that I have is Tunisia Ford and the second one is Shefland Motor. OK, now. Let's. I'm going to do the first table only. Uh, the second table, I'm going to show you the answer. So the, the, for the first one. Uh, the large, uh, the lowest uh, data that I have is 23, and the larger data that uh, I have from here is 39. So I'm gonna do it without the frequency table. So I'm gonna uh, just draw a line. Okay, start from uh, 23, 24, 25, 26. 27, 28, 29, 30. So I'm going to do it up to 39. Okay, then I'm going to uh, start to draw the dots depending on my data. So how many numbers I have as a 20, 23? So I'm going to see, I have only one number. So I only have one. How many uh, number I have as a 24? I don't have uh, 25th from my data. It's only one. So I'm going to start. Okay, how many? Um, 26 from my data that I have. Um, it's only one. So how many 27 that I have from my data? One. And then two. So I have two. Okay. Remember, each dot is represent the appearance of one uh, data. So since I have uh, two as a 27, then I have to put two dots. Now, how many uh, 28 does I have from the data? This is the first one. And this is the second one, so I have two. Okay. How many um, 29 that I have from my data? I only have one. How many 30 I have from my data? One here. And the second one, do you have a second one here? Yes, it's here. So I have to do it twice. So 30, it's a bit twice. 31, it's only every one time. 32, it's one. Uh, two. Three, four. So it's a bit of four times. So one, two, three, and four. Now, how many uh, 33 I have from my data? It's one and two. So it's going to be one, two. How many 34 from my data? I have. I didn't have any 34. How many 35 that I have from my data? It's one, two, three. So I have threes. One, two, three. How many 36 that I have from my data? I have one, two. I have only twos. 
how many 37 that I have from my data. It's one, only one. How many 38 I don't have? How many 39 I have only, sorry, I have only one. Okay, so as you see here, this is my data blot. It's uh, describing my data. So from the first glance at this, that uh, at this data plot, can you find the mean? So the mood. Yes, it's the most appearance or is the most number that has uh, the largest number of uh, dots, which is here. It's mood. It's uh, 32. So the mood is equal to 32. Can I find? Um, can I find the mean? The median, sorry, if I can, I'm gonna eliminate four dots from here and four from here, and then uh, four from here, let's say five, one, two, three, four, five, and then two from here and two from here, then I'm gonna end up with two dots here and the uh, average of uh, uh, 32 plus 32 is so this is um, yes it's 32 so the mood here is 32 and uh, the median also 32 okay now Hopefully it's clear how we construct that. We will do the same for the second table. If you do the same, you will have the same like this. From the second one, we found it has uh, three modes because we have 31, it's the mode, six, uh, 36 is the mode and 37 is the mode, okay? Because it's uh, all uh, repeated at the same amount. Like the, so this number has the same uh, numbers of dots, so they are all the mood. So this is how we can construct uh, that blots. It's so easy, but remember to take all your data. You cannot skip any of your data. Now, from stem and leaf display, uh, stem and leaf display is an alternative way, okay, to represent your data instead of using the frequency distribution and the histogram. Do you remember when you use the histogram in the chapter two? So this is another way to describe your data. Okay, the advantage of using stem and leaf display, uh, first, the identify of, of each observation is not lost. So when you use stem and leaf, you will make sure your observation is not lost you because you will go through all of your data. Now, the digit themselves give a picture of the distribution. What does that mean? Like say you have a data, like say 89, uh, 112, uh, 14, uh, 140, like this. So all the digits here, okay, it all describe the data. Uh, the shape of, uh, it, will give, it will give you the picture of distribution. Also, the cumulative frequencies also are showing by using stem and layer display. So now, what is stem and leaf display? Is a statistic technique to present a set of data. Okay, each numerical value is divided into two parts. So you will divide it in two parts. The leading digit becomes T. So this is the leading digit. Okay, so you will divide it in two parts. This is the stem and the uh, stem sorry, and this is the leaves. Now. Uh, the, digit, uh, the leading digit become uh, the stem and tra uh, trailing digits the leaf. Okay, so this is the leading digit and this is uh, the trailing digit. The stem are located along the vertical uh, axis. Okay, and the leaves value are stacked against each other along the um, horizontal axis. So we're gonna have all this data horizon axis. Okay, this is too general. 
I'm gonna describe how you can construct your stem and leaf display, especially if you have small, uh, small digits of number and how you can also construct if you have a large, uh, like a large number has more digits, let's say. So we're gonna back to this example after I show you this video. So we're gonna see this video first. In this video, we're going to talk about how to make a stem and leaf plot. So let's say we have the numbers 15, 27, 8, 17, 13, 22, 24, 25. Bear with me. I only have a few more to write down. And then 32, 28. 43 and 7. So how can we make a stem and leaf plot using those numbers? Now, we need to make basically a two column table. I'm going to write S for stem and L for leaf. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group the numbers that I have in my list in ascendant order, but by tens. So I have a 7 and an 8 and between 10 and 20, I have two 13s. I have a 15 and a 17. And then in the 20s, let's see, there's a 22, 24, 25, 27, and 28. In the 30s, I have three 32s, and I have a 36. And then I have one number in the 40s, which is just 43. Now, how do we take these numbers here and put it in our stem and leaf plot? Well, let's start with 7 and 8. 0, 7 will correlate to 7. So we're going to put a 0 in the stem column, 7 in the leaf column. Now, 0, 8 will correspond to 8. So all we need to put is an 8 in the leaf column. Now for these numbers, the first digit, the one, we're going to put in the stem column, and then the second digits, we're going to put in the leaf column, 3, 3, 5, 7. And we're not going to put any commas to separate those numbers. So this means we have a 13, and this here is a 15, and so forth. So basically, it's like factoring out the first digit. Now for the next row, we have 22, 24, 25, 27, 28. So now you can see the pattern. And then we have 32, three of them, and 36. And we only have 43, one number in the 40s. And so that's it. That's how you can make a stem and leaf plot from a list of numbers. Now let's try an example that is slightly different from the last one. In a sense that we're gonna have a number beyond 100. Let's put one more number in this list, 113. So go ahead and make a stem and leaf plot in this case. Now it's good to write a key. So the number 85 will correspond to 85. And the number 10, 2 will correspond to 102. So now you, you can see how this is going to work. In the 70s, we only have two numbers. We have 72 and 76. So I'm going to write 2 and 6 in the leaf column. Now in the 80s, we have, let's see, the lowest number is 85 and then 88 and 89. So I'm going to write 5, 8, and 9. Now in the 90s, there's only two numbers, 93 and 97. So let's put 9 and then 3, 7. Now for 10, we have 108 and 102. So we're going to put 2 and then 8. And then for 11, there is 113 and 115. So we're going to write 3 and 5. And so that's how you can make a stem and leaf plot using. 
Okay, uh, this is the basic idea. Uh, can you see the button here? So I'm gonna apply the information that from the video in the this example, and hopefully it will be clear. Uh, let's start. So I have this example, okay? This is the number of people attending each of the uh, 45 performance at the theater of the Republic, okay? Now I have this data, okay? So the lowest number that I have from this data is 88, and the largest number that I have is 156. Okay, now I'm gonna apply the second part of the video because my numbers here is bigger. So since uh, my numbers here are bigger, so I have to apply the, uh, the method. So first I'm gonna organize the data. So let's start. How many numbers that I have in 80? I have 88. Okay, and I have 89, and this one, and this one. Okay, now, do you have another number? No, so this is an 80. Now, how many number I have in 90? I have uh, 93, 94, it's twice. I have 95, 96, also repeated twice, and I have 97. Okay, so I'm gonna take the leading digit, okay, as a step. So I'm gonna write it like this. I'm gonna construct my table, uh, stem and leaf. So the first digit here is eight, so I'm gonna write it as stem eight. And then the other digit is eight and nine. You don't have to put any commas here, only write it uh, beside each other. Now, once you see uh, this uh, table, so I know this is eight, it's belonged to eight here, so it's 88. I know also this eight is uh, belonged to the nine, so it's 89 and so on. Okay, now if I reach 100, now here it's in 90. Let's say I have a numbers as in 100, so I have uh, 103, 100, 3, 100, uh, 4, 100, 6, 100, 7, and 108. Okay, so I'm gonna take, since uh, these are the three digits, so I'm gonna take two digits, okay, and then start to complete my stem. So it's 10, okay, I'm gonna take this digit and represent it as a leaf. Remember, without any comma. So now, I'm done. And then you have to do it all until you reach 15, okay? And you finish your data. Be sure that you don't skip any of your data. You have to take all your data in consideration. So this is the basic idea about stem and leaf. Hopefully it's clear. Now we're gonna talk about another topic, which is called uh, measures of position. Um, the measure, uh, measures of position, they locate special points. They predict distribution into X number of points. Okay, now, quartilize, decide, and percentilize. Okay, um, as I said, they located special, uh, special points because they break distribution into X number of points. What is the X number? I'm gonna talk about it right now. Now, if the set of data, this is a, uh, a reminder, if your uh, set of data is arranged in order of magnitude, the middle value, which is defi which divides uh, the set into two equal parts is the median. Remember the definition, the definition of your uh, the median. If you have a data, okay, you have to organize your data from the minimum to max, and then the middle point or the middle value, this is, we call it median, okay? Now, from this idea, if we extended this idea, we can uh, think about uh, other values, which is divide the set in, into four, as in the quartilize, or, we can divide our data in 10 as decile or even 100 parts as a percentile. 
uh, what is that me? I'm gonna describe it here. Now, mergers of location also describes the shape of distribution and can express as a uh, percentile. Remember, measures of location also describe the shape of distribution. This is important information. Okay, so if I said measures of location can describe the shape of distribution, true or false, so you can say it, it's true because it's really true. You can, from after you measure your location, you can know uh, or you can um, visualize the shape of your distribution. Now, uh, I have a quartilized, which is a fa values of an order minimum to maximum, data set that divided into four equal uh, parts or two uh, equal uh, intervals. Let's say I have my data here, okay? And I divide the data into four parts, okay? Say I divide my data into four parts. Now, each interval is equal to this interval, equal to the interval, equal here. So this is, if I have, let's say, um, one, okay, two, three, six, uh, seven, nine, uh, 11, 12, sorry, uh, 12, um, 11, 12, 15, uh, 17, 20, 25. Okay, now I divide my data into uh, four equal parts because each part it has only three numbers. So that's the meaning of divide your data into equal parts. Now in quarterize, you have to divide it into four parts. In this size, you have to divide it and uh, to ten parts. In uh, percentilize, you have to divide your data into hundred parts. Okay, we're gonna talk about this now. Quarterize. Okay, as I said, you have your data here. You divide your data into four intervals, or in uh, or to uh, four equal parts. Now let's say. Okay, this is my data. You have to start from minimum to maximum. Remember, always measure of location. Uh, you have to organize your data from minimum to maximum. Okay, now if I have uh, this, like this uh, line after I divide my data. Now, if I ask you, where is uh, the first quarter will be ended? Okay. The first quarter will be ended. I'm starting from here. This is the beginning of my data. So I'm starting from here. Okay, now this is the end of my first uh, quarter. So I'm going to call it Q1. Okay, this is my Q1. Now, where is the end of the second quarter? So this is the first quarter. This is the second quarter. So the end is Q2, okay? Q2 is represent my median because it's the middle value. Now, if I ask you, where is the end of Q3? So the end of Q3, it's gonna be here. So now, if I ask you, okay, then this is important. If I ask you, uh, how many quarterlies do we have in, um, in this data type. I have here, I have three quartiles. So if I divide my data into four equal parts, then I'm gonna get three quartiles. In this size, okay, you have to divide your data into 10 equal parts. Okay, after you divide your data into two, uh, 10 equal parts, you'll get uh, gonna find where is D1 and D2 and D3. So let's see here. The first interval will be ended at D1. Second interval is gonna be ended at D2 and so on. 
Now, each info is represent 10% of your data. Okay. Here, in quartilize, each interval represents 25% of your data. Now, you have to uh, make an equivalent in percentage for each quartilize and the size that you have. Now, let's talk about percentage and then see how it's equivalent to quartilize and the size. So now, in the percentage, you have to divide your data in uh, 200 bars. Now, each part is represent 1% of your data. Now, you will gonna have 99 percentage. Okay. So now, from quarterize, I will have three. Okay, I will have three quarterize. In this size, I'm gonna have nine this size. In percentilize, I'm gonna have 99 this uh, percentilize. Okay, now, what is the relationship between this size and uh, this size and quarterize uh, to percentilize? Now, let's start with quarterize. Always, if the question asks you about Q1, then you have to say Q1 is equal to B25. B25, which is the percentilized at 20, uh, 25 um, location. Q2, okay, it's sometimes uh, we say median. So median is equal to B50. Q3, which is the third quartilize, it's equivalent to B75. So you have to memorize this because it's important. If the question asks you about Q1, you have uh, to know it's equivalent to B25. Okay, now, if, sometimes the question will give you the, the value of B, and sometimes it will ask you just to find uh, the, uh, the first quarter. Okay, and then you're going to just uh, said Q1 is equivalent to 25 and then start to use the formula. We're going to have a formula to find the location. Uh, we're going to look at later. Now, in this aisle, okay, you'll get to say D1 is equivalent to B10. D2 is equivalent to B20. D3 is equivalent to B30 and so on. Until you reach D9 is equal to B90. Okay. So you have to memorize this relationship, okay? Just in case it's coming uh, in the quiz, uh, or if I ask you any, to do any problem, you have to know where is the location exactly for each design and each quartilize uh, equivalent to the percentilize. Now let's say, now, as you see here, this is my data, okay? As you see here, the first quarter is represent the, uh, the 25th of the percentilized. Okay, so to represent the 25th of the percentilized, uh, it represents in this size, okay, up to uh, here. So this is, is quarter, uh, the first quartilized equivalent to this size. But the only thing I wanna um, I want you to memorize is the equivalent to percentilize for quartilize and this size. Okay. So let's move on and then we're gonna talk about this later. So this is our formula. Okay, you have to know the location for each value because you have to compare it to percentilize. We're gonna use this formula, which is um, we call it location of percentilized. Okay, now it's uh, LB is equal to N uh, plus one times B over 100. Now, what is B? Is the equivalent location in percentilized. If the question asks you about Q1, so we're gonna B is 25. So now my B here is equal to 25. So this is the idea. Now, what is N? N here is the number uh, of data that you have. And you have to find the data of value corresponding to the sample of uh, percentile. So you must evaluate first this um, using this formula. And then 
you will get a number here after that. This number is represent uh, the quartile that the question asks about it. So if you get eight here, you have to go to your data, find the eight location, and this value of data, it will be, for example, the mean. Okay, if the question asks you about the mean. Now, I'm gonna give a brief uh, definition before I uh, show you the example. So if the question, uh, this is some definition, we have the interquartile uh, inter range, Okay, we'll call it sometime IQR. It's Q3 minus Q1. We have semi interquartilized range. So it's Q3 minus Q1 divided by two. We have mid quartilized. So we're gonna take Q1 plus Q3 divided by two. Okay, uh, this is some formula. You have to, uh, to understand all of them. Now, this is my first example. The question asked to measure uh, the look uh, the measure the location and find the corresponding value. Uh, Morrison Stanley is an investment company with um, offices located through the United States. Listed below are the commissions earned last year by a sample of fifteen brokers. Brokers. So the question asked to find the mean Q1 and Q3. So mean is correspond is uh, equivalent sorry to q2 so q2 as i said equivalent to the mean equivalent to be 50. q1 is equivalent to be 25. q3 is equivalent to be 75. this is you have to memorize as i said before and then apply to your example now, before we start off, you have to look to your data. If it's not organized, then you have to organize your data from minimum to the maximum. Okay, so I'm going to first uh, start to organize my data. This is the first step. And then find the, uh, the question asked to find the median, which is equivalent to be 25, uh, sorry, 50. Okay, then Second step, apply the formula. The formula is LP equal to N plus one multiplied by B over 100. I have N here, which is uh, from my data, the number of my data, which is 15. N equal to 15. And B, as we uh, make an equivalent here, which is 50. Okay, then I'm gonna apply to my data. Then I have eight. Now, eight is a whole number, okay? Because we will have another rule for mixed number. Now, eight is a um, whole number. Then I'm gonna go back to my organized data and start to find where is uh, the eighth location. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is my eighth location, okay? Now, at the eighth location, this is, is the median, okay? So the median, the value of median is 2,038, uh, two, uh, uh, okay? So first, we will find the location with, we, from the formula. The formula gives us the location is in the eighth, uh, in the eighth place. So I'm gonna start from find where the eighth is, which is this one. And then the value of this place is my mean okay now the second requirement is asking about q1 which is the first quartilized now i'm gonna apply to my formula since it's the first quartilized so b here is 25 and then i'm gonna uh, end up with a whole number which is four so i'm gonna back to my data find what is uh, the location for here this is one two three four so this is the four. So the first quartiles are located in the first, and which uh, the value is uh, 1,721. Okay, now the third quartiles, which is B is 72. I'm gonna apply my formula, and then I uh, end up with the, uh, it will be in the 12th location. 
tower is uh, 12th exactly. After you count, this is 12th place. Okay, so the third course uh, trials will be ended here. Okay, and the value of the, uh, the third course trials is 2,205. So this is the basic idea. If you get a whole number, you are lucky, then you have to find where is the location. If you get, for example, here eight, then find where is eight. If you get seven, find where is seven, and so on. After you found the location, then you said Q1 is equal to the value of this location. Now, in some situation, okay, in some situation, your LB will be, uh, will be a mixed number or will be a number is not a whole number. So if your LP is a whole number, then we will do it as the, exam, the previous example. Now, if LP is not a whole number, then the value of bit percentilized is LP value counting from the lowest plus the fraction of LP and then multiply by the distance between LP and the next value. So if I have two numbers that say for uh, three and six, and I ask you to find the distance. So the distance between two numbers, you have to subtract each of these numbers. So I'm gonna say six minus three, the distance between them is three, okay? If I give you, let's say five and eight, and I ask you to find the distance, say so we're gonna eight minus five equals three, so the distance is three. This is always how you can find the distance, okay? It's important because we're gonna use it in, uh, if you have a number, is that a whole number? So the second formula that we'll have for today, alt value is lowest but the fraction of alt b multiplied by the distance between alt and the next value. Now, as I said, if you got a number, is that a whole number, let's say, after you've done with the uh, LP formula, let's say you have 2.5, okay? This is not a whole number, okay? Then I'm gonna see, uh, I'm gonna say two, 2.5 is between uh, second location and third location, okay, from my data. So it's between here. So I don't know what is the value exactly because I will have the, uh, the second value and the third value, but I won't have the value between them. Then I'm gonna apply this formula to find this value. Okay, how we can do that? I'm gonna explain it in example. So this is my first example. So consider that you have this data 18, 15, 12, 6, 8, 2, 3, 5, 10. Okay. The question asks you to find the value corresponding to six, uh, 60 percentile. Here, the question is giving, uh, is give you already that your B is gonna be 60, okay? So you don't have to make any equivalent because you already have it, B is equal to 60. Now, as we said before, the first solution, you have to organize your data. So we organize our data done from my data, I found n is equal to 10, which is n is number of my data. And then I'm gonna apply the second formula, okay, which is uh, the LP formula. So as I said, B, I have from the question, which is B is equal to 16. So I'm gonna apply B is 16. N plus one in here is 10. So it's gonna be 10 plus one, 11. B here is 16. So it's gonna be 11 times 16 divided by 100. So it's gonna be 6.6. .6. Now, did I get uh, a whole number? No, I got um, uh, a number uh, to says mixed number. Now, from this number, the whole number that I have here is six. And the fraction, num uh, the fraction part is 0 0.6. Okay, this is, this is fraction part. This is how you apply it to your formula. This is the fraction part, okay? So I'm gonna take this part, add it to the sixth uh, location value, and then multiply by the distance. So the sixth 
value here my data this is one two three four five six so this is the sixth value which is 10 here so i'm gonna say 10 plus the fraction bars from here which is 0 0.6 multiply by the distance the distance between six and seventh value remember you will take this as your first starting and then take the value following this uh, value. So as you said here, we have to take sixth value. Okay, so we have to take sixth value, which is this. So I'm gonna consider this value and the next one. Okay, and find the distance between them. Now, the distance between 12 and 10 is uh, 12 minus 10, which is two. Okay. Then we're going to calculate. So the value you will end up is going to be 11.2. How you can make sure your work is correct. You will take this and check if it's between uh, the places that you have. Is it between 10 and 12? Yes, it's between because the location that we found is between here. 6.6. .6. This is the location. So it's something between the sixth and the seventh value. This is the sixth and the seventh value. So the value, the value that we uh, we have is eleven point two. Is eleven point two between ten and twenty uh, and twelve? Yes. So this now I said my answer is correct. Okay. Now first you have to organize your data. Second, you have to use LP uh, formula to find the location. Only find the location. If you get a whole number, then good. Go to the data, pick the, uh, the location. If you got a mixed number or a number is not a whole number, then you have to apply the third formula here. Okay, okay. which is L is uh, equal to uh, L value plus the fraction bar multiplied by the distance. Let's see another example. Okay, so both the data set contain the sixth value, which is 91, 75, 61, 101, 43, and 104. For, uh, the question asks to find the first quarter line, which is Q1. Q1 is equivalent to B25. The number of my data that I have here in equal to six. Okay, now first step I have to organize my data from minimum to maximum. Done with that. Second, I have to find the location. So I'm gonna use alt formula. So as I said, B is equal to 25. So alt 25 equal to n, my, uh, n plus one multiplied by B divided by 100. So it's gonna be six plus one, which is seven. So seven times 25 over 100 so it's going to be 1.75. This is the location. Okay, now the location that I have is between, this is the first location and this is the second location. Okay, so the location here is between these data. So it will be between the first location and the second location because 1.75 is between 1 and 2. Okay, so it's going to be something here between these numbers. Do I know what is the exact value? I don't know. I just know where is the location. To know exact value, I have to apply the third formula. So the position for, uh, formula here tell us the first quarter line is located between the first and the second value. Okay, now and then with that, I'm going to write down the formula. L value is equal to the lowest plus fraction of LB multiplied by the distance. Now, lowest value that we have, which is 43. So I'm going to say 43 is lowest. Uh, remember, 43 here, you don't have to take the lowest from your data. No, take which one is the lowest uh, between the chosen position. I have to, uh, I have to choose two position, uh, two position because from LB formula, from the position formula, I found uh, the Q1 
is between the first and second. Okay, so now which one is um, smaller, 43 or 61? It's 43. So I'm gonna say this is the lowest, which is 43, plus the fraction, which is 0 0.75, multiply by the distance between the first and second, which is 18. Okay, then I'm gonna calculate, and uh, after that, I'm gonna end up with 50, uh, 56.5. Now, it's 56.5 between the first and the second uh, position is between 43 and 61. Yes. So 56.5 is between 43 and 61. So I know my answer is correct. So the first quarter line is uh, 56.5. Okay. Another example. So below are uh, the time in minutes a sample of 16 customers had to wait in a local sandwich shop before their order were processed. Okay, I have this data. Okay. Uh, which is about 16 customers. So from this data, I'm going to say n is equal to 16. Okay. The question asks about the third quarter line, which is Q3, is equal to B75. Okay, now, the first step that I have to do is to organize my data from the lowest to the maximum. So I'm going to start to organize my data. Now, I'm going to say the third quarter line is located at, I'm going to use uh, the position formula, which is L75 equal to uh, N plus 1 times B over 100. Okay, now I have uh, I have uh, all the information. So n is equal to sixteen plus one times seventy five over hundred. So it's going to be twelve point seventy five. Do we have uh, a whole number? No, I have a mixed number. So I'm going to find twelve location. Where is the 12th location from my data? So I'm going to start to count. Here, 8, uh, 9, 10, uh, 19, 11, 12. So the 12th, uh, the tw uh, the 12th position is 11. Now the following one, which is 14. Okay, so now I know uh, the third quarter line will be between these data. Okay, I don't know what is the exact value, but uh, I just find out from this formula the location, which is between 11 and 14. So to find the value, I'm going to apply the third formula. This is the second. So I'm going to apply the third formula, which is L value is equal to the lowest plus fraction of LB uh, multiplied by the distance. Now, the lowest uh, we have from here, between 11 and 14, the lowest is 11 times the fraction, which is 0 0.75, multiplied by the distance, which is 14 minus 11. Now, it's going to be uh, 11 plus 0 0.75, uh, multiplied by the distance, which is 3. So the answer is going to be 13.25. So the third quarter line is 13.25. Is it true 13.5 between 11 and uh, 14? Yes, it's true. So now my answer is correct. Okay. Now, the same data. But the question now asks to find the first quarter line. Okay, so the same data, as I said, n equal to 16. The first quarter line, which is Q1, is equivalent to B25. Okay, so first I have to organize my data. Second, I'm going to use the position formula, which is LB equal to n plus 1 times B divided 
by hundreds. Now it's going to be L25 equal to 60 plus 1 times 25 over 100. And then after your calculation, it's going to be 4.25. I also here, I got some example. So I have to apply the second formula. Before we apply the second formula, what is the location for this uh, position? It's between the fourth value, which is one, two, three, four. So this is the fourth value and the following value, which is 50. So now my location is between these numbers. Okay. Now I'm going to apply the, th the third formula, which is alt value. So it's going to be the lowest, which number is lowest, six or eight? It's six plus the fraction of LB here which is 0 0.25 times the distance between 8 and 6, which is going to be 8 minus 6. So it's going to be 6 uh, plus 0 0.25 times 2. So it's going to be 6.5. So the, uh, the first quartile is 6.5. So is it true 6.5 between 6 and 8? Yes, so now my answer is correct. Okay, hopefully it's clear. Uh, the, uh, the other example is exactly the same, uh, the same idea. Uh, you have first to organize your data from, uh, uh, from minimum to the maximum. And then from data, uh, I found N is equal to 16. Uh, the question here asks about to find the third quartilize, which is uh, Q3 equivalent to B75. And here the question asks about to find the third quartilize, which is equivalent to B25. So try to do it by yourself. And then after that, check your slide because I will send you the answer in the slide. Okay, now the other topic we're going to talk about, we, which is we call box blood. So a box plot also is a graphical, uh, graphical display based on quartilides. Okay, we can if you calculate your quartilides, and then I will ask you to present the data using quartilides. The best method to describe that is called box plot. Okay, now the help uh, the the box plot help us uh, use pictures a set of data. To construct a box of blood, you need five statistical figure. Or you have to, you need to know five statistical information. You need to know the minimum value, Q1, which is the first quartilize, Q2, or the median, you have to know all of the, uh, the median, Q3, and the maximum value. So you have two scenarios. Either I will give you the information, and I ask you to choose, um, the box of blood that represent your data, or I'm gonna give you the box of uh, the box of blood picture and then ask you to give me the data. Okay, now uh, I wanted to identify the outlier, which is uh, the value that are in, uh, in constant with the rest of the data and are identified with a sticker in box of blood. So outlier. Let's say this is my box of blood, and this is my maximum and minimum value. So my minimum, and this is my maximum. Okay. Let's say I have uh, a data here. Okay, and I have a data here, which is out of my um, data, or which is is not related to the data. So this point is called outlier. Okay, remember, if you see, uh, if I ask you about this um, data, if you see it's outside or is not constant with the other rest of your data, then you'll say this is outliers. Okay, now, as I said before, the interquartile uh, inter range, you have to subtract Q3 
you say q3 minus q1. Okay, this is definition. You have to memorize it. I'm gonna give you an example about the box plus, how you can construct it and the actual shape of it. Now, this is the example. Alexander's Pizza offer free delivery of his pizza within 15 minutes. So Alex, which is the owner, wants some information on the time it takes for delivery. How long does a typical delivery take? Within what range of time will most deliveries be completed? For and he chose 20 samples of uh, deliveries. And this is the data he found. Okay, this is the data he found. So uh, he found the minimum value of delivery time, which is 30, the maximum time uh, 30. He found the Q1 15, medium 18, and Q3 22. So he, the information all given and ask you to construct uh, a box of blood or to choose a correct answer. Now, uh, we got the first uh, box of blood for the delivery time, and we're gonna conclude the data for using uh, this box of blood. So see, okay, first we're gonna draw a number line, okay? We're gonna uh, draw a number line using an appropriate scale. So you see your data, what is the maximum number and minimum number. And then you will start to drawing uh, a number line. Next, draw a box. The box has some conditions. So first I'm gonna start to identify what is the, max, the minimum value. So from the data that we have, the, um, the minimum value is 13. And the maximum value is 30. Okay, I first identify the minimum and maximum value. Then identify where is the Q1. So the Q1 from the information and that I'm giving is 15. And the Q2 is 22. So I'm gonna draw a box here. Starting from Q1 and Q3. Okay, so after we draw the box begin at Q1 and ended at Q3, after that, we have to draw a vertical line at the medium. So the medium given from the question, which is 18. So then I'm gonna only um, draw a vertical line. Okay, now, after that, we have to extend a horizon line out from Q3 to the maximum value and out from Q1 to the minimum value. Then you have to do it like this, okay? to extend the horizon line. Okay, the, this is the general shape of uh, box of blood. Okay, now I'm gonna show an example how the question. So this is um, here in Alexander Pizza. This is the first scenario. The second scenario, I'm gonna give you the pictures like this and ask you about the median, lower quarter line, upper quarter line and minimum and maximum. Okay, how we can do it? As you see, uh, here is the starting of my data, the minimum, uh, the minimum data. And here is the end date of my data, so which is the maximum. Okay. Now, from the characteristic of box, uh, box uh, plot, I know my box will start at Q1 and end it at Q3. I know the vertical line here will be my median. Okay, then I'm gonna start to work on this data. So let's say the median here is uh, represented by 24. The lower quarter line, which is Q1. So Q1 is equal to 19. Q3, which is the end of the box is equivalent to 28, 28. And the maximum and minimum value is gonna be here. So the minimum 14 and the maximum is 32 from here, okay? So all of this information that you have to give me from the box blood if I ask you. Now, second example, also the same idea. So here's my starting of minimum data and here maximum. 
So I'm going to write it down, minimum, maximum. I know the starting of the box is Q1 and the ending is Q3. I know the middle line will be um, median. Okay, now the median here is corresponded to five. Now, the lower quarter line uh, is evident Q1. So I'm gonna say Q1. Sorry. Q1 is equal to, let's say here, 20.5. Now, upper quarter line is gonna be here, which is Seven point five. Now the minimum value from the data I have, which is one, and the maximum, it's nine. Okay. How we can find this information? It's only from the picture. Okay. We have to understand the exact uh, meaning from the the box tablet, and then you can apply your data to the choices or the question. Now. I'm going to talk about the common shape of data. Remember from chapter three, we said uh, we have uh, symmetric uh, sequences and we have uh, positively sequences and we have predictive sequences. So we do same that depends on our mean, median, and mode. So we said if it's the mean is equal to median equal to the mood so the shape of data that we have is symmetric okay we said if it's uh, the mean greater than the median and the median greater than the mood then we have positive field also we said if it's uh, negatively if the mood greater than the median greater than the mean okay now in this example, or in this uh, shapes of data, okay, so symmetric, here is the symmetric, okay, so uh, symmetric distribution, um, it's going to be the mean and median are equal and the data value are equally separate around this value, okay, now, as you see here, my mean, so it's basically the same idea in chapter three. If you have mean and medium are equal, then you're gonna is symmetric. Now, if you have, let's say your mean is greater than median. Uh, median. Then you're gonna say it's positively secreted. Okay, so uh, a distribution of value is secreted to the right or positively secreted if there a single big. Okay, as you see, we have a single peak here, uh, but the value extended much further to the right of the peak. Okay, so it's going much further to the right of the peak. Um, when you see that, uh, then we're gonna see the mean is larger than the median. Okay, now in negatively secrete, okay, also you have one single peak, uh, the observation extends further to the left in negative direction. As you see, it's extended to the negative direction. Okay, now by the uh, by middle distribution, you will have two or more peaks. As you see here, you will have two or more peaks. This often the case when uh, value are from two or more population. Okay, and it's depend on the mean. Okay, this is the general or uh, the common shape of data. Try to memorize that the mean and medium are equal in symmetric, positively secrete the mean greater than the, the median, in negatively the uh, median is greater than the mean. What is sequences? Okay, so. If you are uh, comparing um, the coverage of sequences, okay, then we can uh, measure the symmetry of a distribution. How? 
we're gonna apply the Pearson coefficient uh, of sequences formula. Uh, SQ, uh, SK is equal to 3x bar minus median divided by s. Now, x bar is the mean. We have the formula, which is sigma x divided by n. Okay, also the median, we can find it from the data. We have the standard deviation, okay, which is the square root of um, uh, the square root, sorry, the square root um, of sigma x minus x bar square divided by n minus one. Okay, so either I will give you the information of me and media and standard deviation, or I will give you the data and you have to calculate each of them separately and apply it in the Pearson coefficient of sequences. So let's say, uh, what is the Pearson coefficient of sequences represent? So the coefficient of sequence ranges from 0, 3 to 3. Always the answer is between 0, 3 to 3. If you get number uh, different than that, you have to uh, check your calculation. Now, a value near minus 3 indicates considerably negative sequences. So if you have a value like minus 2, uh, minus 2.9, uh, minus, uh, let's say, minus 2 or minus 2.9, all this data is considered as a negative sequence. Now, if you have a value, let's say 1, um, point 50, okay, 1, uh, 2, all this value, is, we can say it's a positive sequence. Now, if you have a value is uh, 0, for example, so now, after I done the, uh, using the formula and find out my SQ is equal to zero, then it's symmetric. Now, I'm going to start it off right here. Let's say I have minus three. As I said, the coefficient of sequences is between minus three and three. And then I have uh, minus one, zero, minus, sorry, was it? equal to zero to three. Okay, now the data between minus three and minus, uh, let's say we have here minus two, but the data between minus three and minus one is negative. Okay, between minus one and zero until minus one here, this is symmetric. Minus three up, to, uh, sorry, minus one, okay, it should be minus one. So minus one up to minus three, this is positive. Okay. So if you get a skew between minus three and minus one, this is negative. Uh, all zeros like 0 0.3, 0 0.9, minus 0 0.3, all these symmetric, okay between uh, one and three positive. Okay, let's see this an example. So now I have a sample, okay? I have a sample of students who are asked how much money they take to school every day, okay? Now, the collected data refer the mean. So here I'm giving the information. Mean is 10.75, median 10.50, and the sample standard deviation is $2.25. Now, the question asks, what is the Pearson quotient of sequences? Okay, I have the formula for that, which is SQ. Uh, SK, sorry, is 3x bar mi minus median divided by the standard deviation, uh, the sample standard deviation. So it's going to be 3, 10.75, minus 10.50, this is all given, divided by 2.25, okay? So after you calculate, it's gonna be 0 0.33. Now, B, describe the sequences of the distribution based on the computed coefficient. I finish from uh, K, I have a 0 
So it's 0 0.3, which is here. So it's going to be almost metric. So the distribution here is almost uh, symmetric. Okay. Now, another example, another scenario here. I'm giving all the data. Okay. So the following are the earnings per share for a sample of 15 software company for the year 2016. The earnings per share are arranged from smallest to largest, so they already arranged the data. So the question asks, uh, find me median and standard deviation, and then find the coefficient of sequences. Okay, so first I have to find the mean. Okay. The mean, I have a formula which is x bar equal to sigma x divided by n. Sigma x for my data is equal to uh, 74. So I have to make a sum of all your data. So it's going to be 74, 26, divided by the number of data, which is 15. And it's going to be 4.95. Okay. Done with the mean. Now the median. My data is all uh, organized. I'm going to pick them with value, which is 3.18. OK, so now I have to find the standard deviation. From the formula, which is sigma x minus x bar divided by n minus 1. OK, now you have to make Calculate this, and after you calculate all of them, so we're gonna have four point uh, five point twenty two dollar. Then, with all requirements, then we're gonna use SK, which is the coefficient of sequences. So it's gonna be um, three x bar, which is four uh, point twenty uh, by. Uh, 4.95 minus 3.80 um, divided by the standard deviation, which is 4.22. Okay, then it's going to be 1.017. Now, 1.017, okay, I can conclude that. Um, that uh, it's, it will be a positive sequence. So this is positively sequences. Why? As I said, if you your answer between one up to three, this is positive. Okay. So this is the basic idea about sequences. Now I'm gonna talk about the scatter diagram. So scatter diagram is describing the relationship between two variables. Okay, so it's a graphical tool also to portray uh, the relationship uh, between two variables. Okay, both variables are measured with interval or ratio of the scales. So remember, scatter diagram it has to be with an interval or ra uh, ratio of the scales. Okay, this is important. So now. How we can uh, like uh, describe your data using scatter diagram? I'm gonna see if the scatter of points move from the lower left, okay, to the upper right like this. Then the variable under consideration are directly or positively related. So this one is directly. or positively okay because it's starting from the lower left to the upper right okay it means my data here is positively or directly now what if uh, the scatter of point move from the upper left to the lower right like this okay if the general shape of the uh, of my point move from the 
left sorry the upper left to the lower right as this so we can see this is inversely or negative okay so this one is inversely or negative so for the last one if you see there is no pattern here then we say it's average okay now as you see here if it starts uh, from uh, the left lower to the upper right this is directly or positively if it starts from the upper left to the lower right this is inversely or negatively if there is no pattern like this so we can say it's average so the basic idea about scattered uh, diagram maybe i will give you a picture and ask you what is the pattern or i'm gonna check you if you know which uh, interval we will use the scatter diagram okay it's always interval or ratio of it now the last thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is contingency table okay so it's used to classify nominal scales observation according to two characteristics okay so i'm gonna use um compare my data depending on the characteristic so contingency table is a table used to classify observation according to two identical characteristics okay now it will summarize two variable of interest both variable need only nominal or ordinal remember what is the nominal or ordinal nominal here it's only labels no no order and the ordinal here we will know the order okay but then you uh, you will not know the the difference between each value okay for example students at the university you can classify them by residency in or out the state uh, you can cl uh, classify uh, university student as a freshman junior or senior you can also uh, classify your project as acceptable or unacceptable this is in ordinal level uh, and also you can uh, classify the potter in a school uh, bond uh, referendum or uh, is classified as the party affiliation democrat republic and other okay so this is the, some example and how, how you can uh, about contested table uh, remember here it has to be in nominal and ordinal level this is uh, an example so we are back to our example apple auto group uh, profit com uh, commercial now we calculate the, me the medium which is it was 1882.50 okay so they took two dealership okay so they took all the dealership Kane, and Kane, Olin, Shetland, and Tunisia. Okay, so they compare between the profit and how many cars it sold above uh, the median and how many cars sold below the median. Okay, and then they organize the data like this. So in K, they have 25 cars which is sold above the mean, the median, and they have 27 below the mean. The median in all in the cars that uh, were sold above the median 20 and below 20 shuffling also above the median 90 and below 26 and Tunisia above the mean 26 and below the mean is 70. okay now after we then organize uh, the information in the table we can compare the profits at the full dealership and we'll observe the following okay now 90 of the uh, 90 of the cars sold had a profit of uh, above the mean okay so 19 cars here all above the median okay now for king dealership 25 out of 52 which is here which is um 49 percent 
sold for a profit more than the median. So I have 48% in K where uh, the car, uh, the, the profit of this car above the mean. Now in all in, 50%. Okay, I have 50%. In shipment, I have uh, 42%. Okay. In Tunisia, I have 60%, the, which is the most uh, location or the most uh, location that it make more car or more profit above the, uh, above the median. Okay, so this is the basic idea. It's only compare between the profit of each car that were sold. Uh, there is no, um, no interval, no ratio level here, only nominal and ordinal level. So this is the basic idea. Uh, hopefully it's clear. Um, this is the end of chapter four. Hopefully it's uh, much clearer now. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for listening. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about chapter five, which is a survey of probability concepts. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how to define the probability, uh, how you can calculate it, use the rule of addition or rule of multiplication. Uh, also, we're going to um, determine the number of outcome using the principle of counting. So we're going to discover this topic uh, during this chapter. First of all, what is a probability? In general, it's a numerical value that describes the chance that something will happen. What does that mean? Let's say I have a class, okay? I have a student in my class, both male and female okay so my students uh i have 10 males and i have 12 females okay the total number of my student is 22. so if i want to pick a student from my class what it is the chance that the one who i'll pick it will be male for example okay so basically what you are going to do you will take the number of uh, how many students that you will have in your class, which is 10, okay, and divide it by the total number, which is 22, okay? So this is the, uh, the value of probability that I might pick uh, a male student, okay? Because I have 10 students, then I have 10 outcome, okay? Then I'm gonna take this 10 and divide it by the total. Also, what is the chance to pick a female student? It's the number of female students, which is 12, divided by the total number, which is 22. Okay, so this is the chance that I might pick a, a female student. Okay, so a probability is frequently expressed as a decimal, such as 0 0.7, 0 0.27, and 0 0.50. Okay, it can assume any number uh, from zero to one inclusive. It can, uh, it could be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, up to 0 0.95, for example. Okay, so it could be any number between zero to one. Or you can express it as a percent, such as 70%, 27%, or 50%. So if you express your uh, probability as a percentage, the range value is between 0% and 100% exclusive. Also, if you, uh, if you express your uh, probability as a decimal or as a fraction, your range is between zero up to one, okay? So this is the rule. And the range, if you, is dependent on the, um, on the probability expressed, on percentage or on decimals. So what is the probability? A probability is a value between zero and one inclusive that represents the likelihood a particular event happen. So the closer probability is to zero, the more improbable uh, is the event will happen. 
okay and the closer the probability to one is more likely it will be happen okay now let's say this uh, table is a relationship uh, is shown in the following diagram along with a few of our personal belief okay so as we said if it is closer to zero that's me it cannot be habit if it's closer to one that's it's sure to happen okay so for example if i said our son will disappear this year okay so in my personal belief i i put the priority as a zero which means it cannot be happen now chance uh, slow book will win uh, the country derby okay so the kentucky derby is 0 0.2 which is still almost cannot uh, cannot be happy chance of uh, chance of a hit in single toes of a coin is 50 0 0.50 so it's 50 percent uh, chance it will be happen. Now, chance of rain in Florida this year, as you know, Florida is um, a rainy uh, state. So the chance of rain in Florida this year is one, which is I'm sure it will be happen. Okay, as I said, this is, is dependent on personal belief. No data um, required here. Now, uh, there are some definitions I would like to describe in probability. First one is experiment. Experiment, which is a process that leads to the occurrence of one and only one of several possible results. Okay, so the experiment here in this example, it's called roll a die. You have a die. If you roll the die, so this is our experiment. Or another example, count the number of member of the broad uh, director uh, and furniture 15 um, companies who are over 60 years of age. Okay, so this is another experiment. Now, outcome, which is a particular result of an experiment. Outcome, which is a particular event of experiment, which is all possible outcomes. All possible result or all possible outcome, we call it outcome. Event, a collection of one or more outcomes of experiment is not the event could be all the outcome or it could be one or more outcomes uh, of the experiment. For example, here, when you roll a die, you have uh, all your possible outcomes. It's going to be only six observation. It could be one, two, three, four, five, six, because we have a six faces in the die. Or it could be large number of all possible outcome. In the second example, for example, it could be none. It could be 1, 2, 29, 49, and so on. So we could have like unlimited or uh, a large number of all possible outcomes. Now, some possible events. The event, as I said, it's a collection of one or more outcome of an experiment. So in this example, if uh, the observation of an even number will occur, okay, now how many I have how many uh, if a number it could be from the outcome. It's only three, which is two, four, six. So the observation, uh, the observe of an if in number only three. Observe of number greater than four. How many number I have is greater than four here? I have only two numbers, which is five and six. So only two. Observe a number three or less. Okay. So how many numbers? Starting from three or less, so three to one, which is three. So as I said, if it's, it's a collection of one or more outcome of an experiment. Now, here, another experiment, more than 30 are, uh, are over 60. So this is only an one outcome from uh, this experiment. Fewer than 20 are over 60, which is still an event a collection of one or more outcome of the experiment. So this is basically the idea. Always remember outcome, it's all the possible uh, result from the experiment. Now, how we may approach to assigning a probability. So the objective method based on the information and data. We have 
two called classical and empirical. So the classical uh, and empirical is, we call them as an objective method. And we have another method we call this objective method, which is based on personal belief or estimated of an event like hot. Okay. And the objective method is based on information and data. So this is the big differences here. Objective is based on information and data. Subjective is uh, based on person uh, belief or estimated of an event. Okay, so let's say, what is the classical probability? The classical definition of probability applies when there are n equally likely outcome to an experiment. When are n equally likely outcome to an experiment? So you will. The formula for classical probability is number of favorable outcome divided by the total number of possible outcome. Okay, so this is, we call this is classical probability, which is the probability of an event, number of favorable outcome, uh, favorable outcome divided by the total number of possible outcome. Okay, now another concept, it's called mutually exclusive which is the accuracy of one event means that none of other events can occur at the same time. None of other events can occur at the same time, only one event. Okay, this is what we call mutually exclusive. Example, if you decided to attend a four-year university, uh, present for example, this is, is, we call this as a, a mutually exclusive outcome because you cannot uh, attend the school or you cannot decide to attend the school or not to attend in the same time. You have to decide uh, one, de uh, one uh, decision even to attend this, uh, the school or not. It cannot be happen at the same time. So this is what we mean by mutually exclusive. Another example, a high school senior decided either to attend or not. As, this, as I said, so a, de a decision to this to do both is not logical because he cannot attend or not in the, at the same time. Collectively exhaustive, which is at least one of the events must occur when experiment is conducted. Okay, so at least one of events, I should have at least one event like, uh, must occur when experiment is conducted. So if I have one result, this is called much, uh, collectively exhaustive experiment. Uh, example, sorry, for the die toasted experiment, every outcome will be either even or odd. So the set is collectively exhaustive. Okay, so it's either even or odd. Now, empirical probability or relative frequency is the second type of objective probability. It's based on the number of time if in a cure as a proportion of a knowing number of trade. Okay, so the impression probability is the probability of event happen is the fraction of the time similar event happen in the past. So you're comparing your probability uh, now uh, to the something is happening in the past to um, get your estimation. Okay, so the formula to determine impression probability is Empirical probability is number of time the events occur divided by the total number of observation. Okay, all in the past. Okay, so so the empirical approach uh, to the probability is based on what we call law law uh, law of large numbers. So if you have a large number, always com it's possible to uh, it's best to compare it to the to the past. So the key to uh, establishing probability empirically is that more observation will provide a more accurate estimate of probability. So the law of large numbers, of a large number of trail, the impression probability of the event will be approached is through probability. Okay, so let's see this example. So the total of successful flight, okay, is the number of successful flights divided by the total of number of flights. So if you want to find uh, the probability of successful flights, you will take the number of all successful flights that you will have in your system and divide it by the total number of flights. 
okay? So if you do the division, it's going to be 0 0.98, okay? This is how you calculate your empirical uh, probability. Another type which called subjective probability. So if there is a little or no more experience or information in which to the base uh, of probability, it's estimated subjectively, okay? So essentially this means an individual uh, evaluate the, evalu uh, the available opinion and the information and then estimate it or assign the probability. This probability is called subjective probability, okay? So the likelihood of a particular event happen that is assigned by individual based in whatever information is available. Here, sometimes we don't have any data, so you can make your estimation based in your um, uh, in your favorable result. Okay. So to illustrate this, I'm gonna give you some example. So estimating the likelihood of New England um, waitresses will play in the Super Bowl next year. Okay. You can say um, my estimation is. Let's say uh, 2045, for example. Okay, so this is my estimation. Estimate the likelihood that you are involved in auto automobile accident during the next 12 months. Okay, so this is some example. There is no data here. Estimating the likelihood the US budget uh, defected will be reduced by half in the next 10 years. Do we have an information? No, just an estimation. So this is the basic idea about subjective probability. So to sum up, I'm gonna describe each type. So approach to probability, you have two main uh, category, which is what objective and subjective. Okay, so the objective is divided to a classical probability and empirical probability. Okay, so the classical probability is based on equally likely outcome. It, both of them based on data, but classical is based on equally likely outcome and empirical probability is based on relative frequencies. Subjective is based on whatever uh, information is available to you or on your personal estimation. Okay, now I'm going to start by give you some rules uh, to use it uh, when you uh, we use it uh, when you count your probability. So when you use, uh, the first rule is called the rules of addition. So when you use the special rule of additions, the event must be mutually exclusive. As we said, we have two types of events. The first type is mutually exclusive and the other is called collectively exhaustive. So when you use the special rule of addition, be sure that they all mutually exclusive. Okay, so recall, mutually exclusive means that when one event occur, none of other events can occur at the same time. So this is the basic idea about mutually exclusive. So the rule of addition refers to the probability that any two or more events can occur. Okay, let's say what is the formula for the special rule of addition. Okay, as we said, remember it's used when they when the events are mutually exclusive. So Probability of event A or uh, or B, it could be B, probability of A, union uh, B is equal to probability A, A plus probability of B. Okay, so it could be like this or it could be or. It, um, it depends uh, on the question, but just be sure, uh, don't mix up between them. Okay, so. The probability is A or B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B. Okay, this is the Venn diagram. Okay, so the event of A and B, they are mutually exclusive. There is no joint uh, part between them. So this is what we mean by mutually exclusive. So let's see, listen. So what happened if I have three events? Now I have two events only. What happens if I have three events? If you have three events, okay, as this event A, B, and C, so it's going to be for three mutually exclusive events, should be all of them mutually exclusive. So you can say 
probability A or B or C, it's going to be a probability of A plus probability of B plus probability of C. OK, so this is if you have more than two events. Let's say an example. Uh, a machine fills plastic bag with a mixture of beans, broccoli and other vegetables. Most of the bag contain the correct weight, but because of the variation in the size of the bean and other vegetable, a package might be underweight or overweight. OK, so when we conduct the experiment to check the 4000 package filled in the past month. OK, they checked 4000 package filled in the past month refilled. So the number of uh, package that they are underweight is 100 package. The number of package they are satisfactory, which is uh, they are in the uh, correct weight, 3600. The number of packages they are overweight is 300. So first I'm going to count each probability for each event. So the probability of event A is how many uh, packages they are um, underweight. We have it here, which is 100 divided by the total number, which is 400, 4,000. This is from the question. If you count them, they are 4,000. So it's going to be 0 0.025. So the probability of, uh, of A is 0 0.025. The probability of B is 3,600 divided by 4,000. So it's going to be 0 0.9. The probability of C is going to be the total number of uh, packages that they are overweight, which is 300 divided by 4,000. So it's going to be 0 0.075. Okay, this is how you can calculate each probability for each event. Now I have the probability here. Remember, always the total of a probability is equal to 1. If you have an events, they are mutually exclusive. The total number of all uh, the probability is equal to one. This is by default. OK, so if you calculate these numbers of oh, the probability here and here and here, it's going to be equal to one. OK, now let's answer the question. So the first question said, what is the probability that a particular package will be either underweight or overweight? OK, so the question here asks, what is the probability that the particular package will be either underweight or overweight? Now, probability underweight, which is A, OK, the event is called A, overweight, which is C. OK, so from uh, from the rule here, it's going to sorry here, it's going to be probability of A plus probability of B. Of C, okay. Now, why I choose this? Because all the events they are mutually exclusive. The package is is not; it cannot be fit in one or more category. So, my package, let's say, I have a package. So, when I weight this package, it's uh, it's only overweight or uh, underweight or satisfactory or overweight. It cannot be fit into category. Okay. That's why we call this is mutually exclusive. So it's going to be probability of A plus probability of C. So probability of A when we count it is 0 0.025. Probability of C it's going to be 0 0.075 equal 0, uh, 0 0.1. OK, so now we count them. Now, what is the probability that a particular package will be either underweight or satisfactory? So underweight or satisfactory, which is event A and B. So the probability A or B, and again, these events are all mutually exclusive. So it's going to be B A, probability of A plus probability of B equal to the probability of A when we count it is 0 0.025 plus the, the probability of B, which is 0 0.9. So it's going to be uh, 0 
0.925. Okay, so the probability of A or B is 0, 0 0.925. And the probability A or C is 0 0.1. Okay, this is how we can, can uh, count the probability of uh, of an event. And the events here are much more exclusive. Complement rule. Remember complement rule from BUS 101. The complement rule is used to determine the probability of an event happening by subtract the probability of an event not happening. Okay, so the complement rule, let's say I have a probability of f and a. Okay, so the probability of f and a is equal to subtracting one um, from the probability of b, okay, which is here, the probability of a not happening. Okay, so checking the complement is Let's say the probability of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of uh, which is a complement event. So this is uh, this is the rule, and we use this uh, to determine the probability of an event occurring by subtracting a probability of event not occurring. So this is not occurring. Okay. Now, why this rule is useful? Because sometimes it's easier to calculate the probability of an event happening by determining the probability of uh, it uh, not happening. And subtract the result from one. And here, B, probability of A and the probability of the complement of A, they are mutually exclusive, which means if you make a sum of these, it's going to be one. So, probability of A plus probability of the complement of A is going to be one. Okay, remember these events are mutually exclusive. Now, from Penn diagram, if you see, this is the event A. So the complement of this event, it's all the area outside. This is complement of A. Okay. This is how we can determine your complement of A. Let's say an example. Here. Uh, you can also uh, use the complement rule by this example. If I ask you find the complement A or C, okay, you can use the method, the, uh, the previous method, which is A or C equal to probability of A plus probability of C, or you can use complement. Okay, let's see how we can use the complement. Now, this is the uh, the event A, and this is the event B, sorry, C. Okay, now, the cup the cup limit for this event which is the one is not included is event b okay so if you take the cup limit of event b okay then it's equivalent to calculate the event a and event c so it's going to be like this b uh, probability a or c equal to probability for cup limit of b okay so complement of B, if you uh, if I ask you what is the complement of event B to the fin diagram, okay, you basically will say this is B and the complement is event A and event C. Okay, so that's um, what is me is complement is equivalent because complement of B, you will take uh, the remaining uh, event, which is A and C, okay. Now, I took the complement of B, complement of B by the rule, uh, the probability of complement of B is one minus probability of B. Okay, now one minus probability of B, it's equal to 0 0.9, which is 0 0.2, uh, sorry, 0 0.1. Okay, so this is how we can calculate the probability uh, using the complement rule. You have a choice to use this one or the complement, but using the, uh, the complement, it's much easier because you always subtract from one, but it's important to determine which events to choose as a complement. If you get wrong this one, your answer will be incorrect. Okay, so let's see. 
another example. Uh, what is the probability of event A or B using a complement rule? Okay, so now A and B from uh, the Venn diagram, this is A and this is B. Now, A and B is equivalent to say the complement of C because complement of C, okay, is equivalent to A and B. Okay, complement of C is the same exactly as a if and A and B. So I'm going to say it is the same as a probability of complement C. Okay, equal to complement of uh, probability of complement of C from the rule is one minus probability of if and C. Okay, now the probability of if and C here, which is 0 0.075. Okay, it's equal to uh, it's equal to uh, zero zero point nine two five. Okay, now the probability B or C. This is my B and C. This is B, and this is C. So the probability of uh, A and C is equivalent to say is the complement of A. Because if I ask you what is the complement of A, is the event B plus event C. Okay, so they are similar. So I'm going to say it's the same as a probability of uh, complement A. By rule, the probability of complement A is 1 minus probability of A. This is from, uh, from the rule here. What is it here? Okay, so now it's going to be 1 minus probability of A uh, from the table is 0 0.025 and it's equal to 0 0.975. Okay, this is how you can calculate it uses the complement method or the complement rule. Okay, another example. Now, referring to the previous example of the variety of the bag of mixed uh, vegetable, now, as we said, the, uh, the probability of uh, a, ba a bag that underweight is 0 0.25 and the probability of overweight bag is 0 0.075. Now, the question said use the complement method or the complement rule uh, to show the probability of satisfactory bag. Okay, now let's begin. Now, uh, the probability of the bag is unsatisfactory equal to the probability of the bag is overweight. Okay, now from the schedule here, satisfactory, okay, satisfactory, it's mean the event of B. Unsatisfactory, which is the complement, it's mean event A and event C, which is the underweight and overweight. Okay, so let's see here, it's equal event of uh, the probability of event A or C, which is equal probability of A plus the probability of C equal to 0 0.25 plus 0 0.75, which is equal to 0 0.1. Okay. So this is the probability of the bag is unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory, which means they, all the bags are underweight or overweight. This is by um, the briefest method. Okay, now the bag is satisfactory if it is not underweight or overweight. Okay, now let's, from this, uh, from this uh, one, let's use the complement. Now, it said it's satisfactory if not underweight or overweight. So the probability of satisfactory, which is probability of B, is equal to one minus the probability of A plus probability of C. Okay, so probability of A is the underweight and uh, probability of C is the overweight. Why we subtract it from one? Because the question said, the bag is satisfactory if it's not underweight or overweight. So now we have to calculate 
So it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.025 plus 0 0.075. So it's going to be 0. Point, sorry, 0. Point 0.9. Okay, so the quality of P by Kaplan method, it's 0. Point 0.9. You can calculate it by um, the, the regular uh, method or by the complement method. Okay, so the pin diagram, as you see here, so the probability of uh, the bike is satisfactory. Okay, so A here is 0 0.25 and C is 0 0.75. So not A or C, which is satisfactory, is 0 0.9. Okay, this is how we can uh, describe your events as a fin diagram. Now, general rule of addition. Okay, so it's used, the general rule it's, of addition is used when the events are not mutually exclusive. So if the events, uh, if the events are mutually exclusive, we use the special rule of addition. But here, because our events are not mutually exclusive, we're going to use the general rule of addition. Okay, first, what is the joint probability? A joint probability is that measure the like who two or more events will happen um, constantly. Okay, like this one, this is joint probability. Okay, so the events here are not mutually exclusive. Now, what is the general root of addition? Probability A or B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability uh, A and B. Okay, in some situation, you will see instead of R, like this, and instead of B, intersection. Okay, so just be careful. If you see this is, uh, this sign, instead of R and A, they are mean the same thing. Now, is the special rule of addition part of the general rule of addition? Yes, because let's say I have this event as an A and B. Okay, they are mutually exclusive. So probability of A or B is equal probability of A minus probability of B plus, sorry, minus probability of A and B. Okay, now probability of A, let's say probability of A plus probability of B, we can calculate it if we have an information, minus probability A and B. Do we have a joint uh, probability between A and B here? We don't have, and then we represent it by zero. Okay, this is Lee. The special rule is become as a probability A or B equal to probability of A plus probability of B. So this is a special rule. As we study, as we learned in the previous example, okay, always if it's mutually exclusive, use this method because the joint part is going to be equal to zero. Okay, for general rule, there is a joint uh, probability here, and then we have to apply uh, this part. So it's going to be probability of A or B equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A and B. Okay, and this is, we're gonna calculate also for this. Let's say here, an example. So a sample of 200 tourists in Florida shows 120 went to Disney, 100 went to the Bosch Gardens, and 60 visits both. 60 from the tourist visit both, uh, places. So we're going to start first by applying the general rule. So probability for people who visit Disney or Bosch is equal to probability of people visit Disney plus probability of um, uh, people visit Bosch Garden minus the probability of people visit both. Okay, so let's say in the fin diagram, this is how many people visit Disney. Okay, this is all. And another uh, in the green, how many people they are visit Bosch Garden? This is all. Now, 
how many people visit both? So how many people visit both is only the orange part. Okay, that's what, what we are mean are not mutually exclusive because there is a, a joint probability. Now let's back to our example. Now, how many people are visiting uh, Disney is 120, 120 uh, divided by the total, which is 200 plus the probability of people who visit in push carded, how many, which is 100 divided by 200 minus how many people visited both, which is uh, 60 divided by 200. Now, start to calculate. Okay, so it's going to be the probability of uh, 160 divided by 200, so it's going to be 0 0.8. Okay, so what is the probability of people who visit Disney or Porch is 0 0.8. Okay, this is how we can calculate it. We use the general method of the general rule because our events are not mutually exclusive. Okay, another example here. An example of employees of Ford Wide Enterprise is to be surveyed about a new healthcare plan. The employees are classified as a following. Okay, so the classification that I have, uh, supervisor, maintenance, protection, management, and secretary. Now, the person who are in supervisor, uh, supervisor uh, class, for example, it cannot be the same time as the protection, uh, protection uh, sector, for example. So that's mean our events here mutually exclusive. Okay, mutually exclusive. So I'm going to apply the special rule. I'm going to apply the special rule here because my events are mutually exclusive. So let's start A. What is the probability that the first person selected is either in maintenance or secretary okay so before we start we have to count how many numbers of employees because we don't know the total number so i'm gonna count how many num uh, number of employees here so 100 uh, plus 20 uh, sorry plus 50 plus 1460 uh, plus uh, 302 plus 68 it's gonna be 2000. So the total of employees in this company is 2000. Okay, so total number of employees equal to 2000 employees. Now for A, the question asks, uh, what is the probability that the first person selected is either a maintenance or a secretary? Now, maintenance is considered as an F and B, okay? And secretary would uh, consider as an F and A, okay? So, and the, remember, they are mutually exclusive, okay? So, I'm gonna start probability of B or A. It's gonna be probability of B plus probability of A equal to now probability of b how many number in maintenance 50 or for the total number 2000 plus how many uh, number of people in secretary which is 68 divided by 200 so it's going to be 180 divided by the 200 so it's going to be 0 0.059 okay so the probability of the person um uh, of the first person selected at 0 0.059, okay? This is I. Now, for the second part, not in management. So if it is not in management, I'm gonna apply here the probability of the complement. So so if it's not in management, so that's mean I'm gonna calculate the probability of uh, the complement. Now, management is D, so I'm gonna apply the complement of D. Why? Because if this person is not in management, 
why I have to calculate for the probability of management? I'm going to calculate for uh, the complement of management to find the probability. So it's going to be 1 minus probability of t from the rule is going to be 1 minus 0 0.151 equal to 0 0.849. So the probability that person is not in management is 0 0.849. Now, can I calculate it using uh, another method? Yes, you can. Take the probability for the secretary and production and maintenance and supervisor and make a sum of all these probabilities. So it's going to be uh, the probability that, that this uh, first person is not in management. But instead of doing all of that, I'm just going to apply the complement, which is easier. Now for B, uh, draw a fin diagram. Okay, let's draw this the fin diagram. Now for for I, uh, the event, as we said, is uh, mutually exclusive. So this is my event P, and this is my event A. Okay, and this considering as my event. Okay, now this is for I. I I, which is uh, not in management, so I'm gonna apply the management, which is D. Since the person is not in management, then it's be the outside of the uh, the circle. Okay, so this is how we can draw our fin diagram. Now the last one, which is C, are the effect in part A uh, AI uh, complementary uh, or mutually exclusive or both? As we said, they are mutually exclusive. As we see in the fin diagram, they are mutually exclusive. Okay, so this is all the idea about uh, the rule of um, the rule of uh, addition. Okay. Now we have another rule. It's called the rule of um, the rule of multiplication. So the rule of multiplication uh, are applied when two or more events accrue uh, simultaneously. Okay, which means they will occur uh, in the same time. Okay, but you have uh, each occurrence not affected the probability of the other. Let's say. So the special rule of multiplication refers to the events that are not. Uh, they are sorry. They are independent. The event independent, but uh, they occur like after each other. Let's say special rule of multiplication is the probability of A and B equal probability of A times probability of B. Now, independent, it means the occurrence of one event has no effect on the probability of the occurrence of the other event. Okay, so the occurrence of one event has no effect on the uh, probability of the other events because they are independent. Now, if we have three independent events, okay, so your uh, your rule is going to be probability A and B and C is equal to probability of A times probability of B times probability of C. Okay, this is what we have if we have more than um, one event, uh, two events, sorry. So now, let's see an example about the special rule of multiplication. Now, a survey by American Automobile Association referred that 60% of members made a reliable reservation last year. How many members? 60%, which is equal in, in, uh, in decimal 0.6. Okay, two members are selected at random. What is the probability both? made a, uh, a reliable reservation last year. Okay, what is the variety? They are both made the same uh, of made a reliable reservation last year. Okay, so because of uh, AA member is very large, we, may, we can assume they are independent. Okay, so the variety of the first person, let's say R1, and the second person R2. 
okay? And they are independent because it's assumed that because they are a large number. Now, the probability of the first person made an airline reservation last year, okay, which is the probability of R1, as we said, it's 0 0.6, okay, which is 60%. Now, the probability that the second member selected made a reservation also, which is the probability of R2, is equal to 0 0.6, okay? Now, I'm gonna use the formula, which is the probability R1 and R2, okay? It's gonna be probability of R1 times probability of R2, it's gonna be 0 0.6 times 0 0.6, so it's gonna be 0 0.36, okay? So this is the probability that they are both make a reservation, okay? Another example. Okay, so this is the example. Uh, I'm gonna assign another examples uh, in the end of the chapter to make it more practice, okay? Now, we learned the, uh, the special rule of multiplication. We have another rule, it's called general rules of multiplication. We use this rule if our effects are not independent, okay? Are not independent. Now, the general rule of multiplication refers to the effects that are not independent, okay? What is independent? Because the probability of particular effect occurring you have to subtract the first, or um, you have to take away the another event that is occur already. Okay, it's not it dependent like this example. Each event is independent. Each event I'm gonna use the same percent because they are independent. There's no effect on the other. But here they are not independent. I have to take uh, the probability of the first event and then start to count again. So let's say. First, the formula, and then I'm going to give an example to make it more clear. So general rule of multiplication, probability A and B is equal to probability of A times probability of B giving A. You will take A and then start to count your probability of B. Now, so the condition, this is, uh, is also called conditional probabilities. So it's uh, represented by probability of B giving A. So... If you wanted to count for the conditional probability, use the general rule of multiplication, okay? So it's read the probability of B giving A. Now you can extend the general rule if you have them uh, more than two events. So for three events, for example, A and B and C, the formula is gonna be probability of A and B and C is equal to probability of A times probability of B giving A, okay? or probability of B, uh, so probability of C giving A and B. You have to take A and B and then count the probability of C. So now I'm gonna give you an example to make it more clear. So a golfer has 12 golf shirts in his closet. Okay, so this one, uh, this golfer has um, 12 shirts in his closet. Suppose nine of these shirts are white, he has three, uh, nine, sorry, nine shirts are white and the other are blue and the remaining which is blue. So he gets dressed in the dark, okay? So he just grab a shirt and put it on. He plays go golf two days in a row and does not retain the shirt to the closet, okay? So the event A, he took a shirt, okay? But he didn't retain it to the closet. So the number of shirts, it will be reduced. Now, what is the, the probability both shirts are white? So now for the first time, he picked a shirt, okay? And then he didn't retain it. The, uh, the total of shirts was in his closet, 12. In the FNTB, okay, the, since he, he didn't retain the first shirt, so the total number of shirts it will be 11 and so on. So this is the idea. You have to move the first event and start to count again. So let's see this example. So let's assume the first event is W1 and the second event is W2. Okay, now probability of W1 and W2 
is equal to. Now, the events here are not independent, okay? Because he didn't retain the shirt. If it's he retained the shirt to the his closet, now it's become an uh, independent event. But now he didn't retain it, so that means my events are not independent. So let's say probability of W1 and W1. No, we apply uh, the rule. It's going to be probability of W1 times probability of W2 giving W1. Okay, so now I'm going to apply it. Probability of W1, how many uh, white shares I have in the first? I have nine, which is the total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And divided by the total share, which is 12. Okay, this is the W1. Now, how we can calculate W2? Now, since he didn't retain the shirt, I'm gonna remove this one and start to count again. Now, how many shirts I have in W2? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have eight shirts as a white, and the total now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, 10, 11. So I have 11 shirts because I removed this one. So my total now is become as an elephant. Then I multiply, so it's gonna be in the end 0 0.55, okay? So remember to start to count again, if you have probability of W2 giving probability of uh, W1, okay? Now, what is the probability of selecting three white shirts without replacement? So he did that, uh, and the third day the same. So let's count our probability now. So we will have three events, probability of W1 and W2 and W3. We have three events. So I'm gonna first apply uh, the rules, which is probability of W1 times probability of W2 giving W1 times probability of W3 giving W1 and W2, okay? So let's start count again. So the first day, okay? The first day, which is the probability of W1, he took a shirt. So he took this one, okay? Now, how many white shirts I have in my closet? I have nine and the total 12, okay? This is the first day. Now. I took this shirt away and start to count for the uh, probability of W2 giving A, uh, W1, sorry. So it's going to be how many white shirts now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And my total is 11. Okay. Now, probability of W3. So since I took this, I'm going to remove it. Okay. So now, how many white shirts still in my closet? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many total now I have is 10. The total share to my closet is 10. Then I'm gonna multiply. After you uh, multi um, did the multiplication, the probability is gonna be 0 0.39, Okay, so the probability of selecting three white shares without replacing is 0 0.38. Hopefully it's clear. Uh, what we have learned so far, we learned the special rule of uh, addition and general rule of addition, special rule of uh, multiplication and general rule of multiplication. Hopefully it's clear. Now let's talk a little bit about contingency table. So the contingency table is the table used to simplify sample observation according to two or more identifiable category or classes. So we learned this in chapter four. Uh, now we're going to use it here in probability. So 150 adults, this is an example, 150 adults were asked about their gender and the number of Facebook accounts they used. The following table summarize the result. Okay, so they will ask about the gender, male and female, and the number of Facebook accounts they used. Now, let's assume um, in gender I have B1 and B2 event because men represent B1 and women represent B2. How many face accounts? Let's say this event represented by A1, 
a to a three. Okay, so if I ask you what is the probability that um, the number of uh, accounts uh, or people have one or sorry, people have one more, uh, have one only uh, Facebook account that will be men. Okay, now let's say here how many number um, of Facebook accounts or men, which is 40. Okay, now how you can describe it? Now, how many both gender only have one account? 70. How many only women have one account? 30. Okay, so from this table, we're gonna calculate uh, the probability of each event. Okay, by applying uh, the rules of addition and multiplication. Let's say another example. Last month, the National Association of Theatre Managers conducted a survey of 500 randomly selected adults. The survey asked uh, responses their age, so they ask first about the age and the number of time they saw a movie in theater. Okay, after they done with the survey, they uh, collected all the information in this table, in this uh, contingency table. So, divided on age, they uh, divided uh, uh, to three groups, less than 30, up between 30 and 60, and 60 or older, okay? And movie by a month, zero. That means they didn't attend any movie during the month, uh, between one or two movies, uh, between three, four, or five movies, or six or more, okay? So, now let's say, what is the first question? What is uh the probability of selected an adult who attend six or more movie per month okay select an adult that attends six or more movie now how many how many total of adults attended six or more movie is 50 because the total here 50. okay so how many um how many people that they attend, uh, how many adults, sorry, they attend a movie, a six or more movie? 50. So I'm gonna take the probability of the event is called A4 from the schedule, from the table. So the number of people who attend only six or more, 50. I'm gonna divide it by the total, which is 500. So it's gonna be 0 0.1, okay? So this is how you calculate for one event. Now, B, what is the probability of selected adults who attend two or fewer movie per month? Who attend two, which is here, event two, uh, A2, or fewer. So I'm gonna take the probability for A1, uh, A2 or A1. Now the events here are mutually exclusive, why? Because the person who attend two or uh, one or two movie cannot be, we cannot say they attend zero movie because they are different. So the events here are mutually exclusive. Okay, now my event is mutually exclusive. So what is the probability? Is the probability of, sorry, is the probability of um, A1? or A2, since they are mutually exclusive, then we're gonna apply the special rule of addition. So probability of A plus probability of A2, it's gonna be uh, probability of A here, A1, which is 75, over 500, which is the total, plus probability of A2 is 200, uh, divided by 500, so it's going to be 275 divided by uh, 500. By 500, so it's going to be 0 0.55. Okay, now this is the, the probability of uh, adults who attend two or fewer movie. Now, see, select selecting an adult who attend six or more movie per month or 
is 60 years of age, okay? So let's say first, are the event mutually exclusive or collectively? Sorry, let's remove these. Now, the question said six or more movies, which is here, here. Now, and it said 60 years of age. What is the 60 year of age? This is the 60 year of age or older. Oh, sorry. So here, here is my uh, first event and here is Okay, now how we can, as we see here, our event is not mutually exclusive because we have a number here. They are um, collectively. So how we can calculate that? I'm gonna apply the general rule of addition. Okay, so it's gonna be probability of, so my, my first event, which is A4, or probability of B3, equal probability of A4 plus probability of B3 minus probability of A4 and B3. Okay, why I did that? Because when I when I look to the schedule, I found there's intersection here, so I have to use the general rule. Okay, so now the probability of A4, which is uh, 75, sorry, 50, it's from the schedule. Here the A4, which is 50. 50 of the total, 500 plus the probability of 60, uh, six or order, 60 or order is 175, because this is the total, okay? Minus the, the time when we uh, meet with both uh, probability, which is 30%, divided by 500. So it's going to be after you call, um, after you do uh, the calculation, it's going to be 0 0.39. OK, so first take the probability of six or more, uh, six or more movie per month, which is 50. And take the probability of people who are 60 or older, which is 175. And then T, take, um, uh, subtract the probability of people who attend six or more movie and they are six, 60 years or older. Okay, so this is the, basically the idea. Now D, selecting an adult uh, who attend six or more movies per month, giving um, giving the person 60 year or old, um, if, uh, so sorry, 60 years of age or older. Now, here the question say giving. Okay, so I'm gonna apply uh, the general rule of multiplication. And now here my event is not, uh, is not um, independent. So my events here are not independent, so I have to apply the general rule of multiplication. So let's say I'm going to apply the formula first. So the probability of uh, B3 and A4 is equal to probability of B3 times probability of A4 giving B3. Okay, the question, select an adult who attend six or more morphe per month, giving the person is 60. So the person is 60, which is giving here. So I'm gonna, so this is what I have to collect. I'm gonna just label it. So this is what I have to collect it. Okay, how I can collect it? I'm gonna take this and as my verb, my unknowing which is A4 giving B3 equal to probability A4 and B3, or it's gonna be B3 and A4. So it's similar, B3 and A4 divided by probability of B3. 
basically what I did, I defined this one here to uh, isolate uh, the requirements. So now the probability of A4 giving B3 is equal to, now the probability of uh, B3 and A4, where is B3 and A4? So this is the B3, the B3 and A4, which is 30. So the probability is 30 over 500 divided by the probability of B3. Now, what is, is the probability of B3? Is this, which is 175. 175 divided by the 500. So now I'm gonna just organize it. So it's gonna be 30 over 500 divided by 175 over 500. Okay, and then to have to solve it, it's gonna be 30 over 500 times 500 over, you have to invert the second, uh, the second fraction. So it's gonna be 30 over 175 and then the probability after you do the division is going to be 0 0.17. Okay, so this is how you can, um, this is how you can uh, find the probability of uh, the adults who attend six or more movie per month giving the person is 60%. This is a conditional. That's why we have to apply the general rule of multiplication. Now, for A, selecting an adult who attends six or more movies per month, and uh, he is or she is 60 years of age of order. Okay, now this is a conditional. So, giving B A4 and B3. Now, back to our table. So, let's say this is people who attend, which is 60 or more. Now, uh, sorry, uh, attend six or more movie, and it should be they all 60 or older. Since they are 60 or older, so I'm gonna find where, where uh, my information intersect, which is at 30. So it's gonna be 30 over 500, which is 0 0.06. Okay, now here is said select adults who attend six or more be and so I'm gonna apply this. If it said all, I'm gonna apply uh, the method, uh, the general rule of addition in, uh, in C. Okay, so this is the idea. Now, tree diagram is to visualize, is a visual that uh, a help in organizing and collecting probabilities for a problem with several stages. So if you have a problem with several stages, using tree diagram, it will make it easier to you to calculate. Each stage of problem is represented by a branch of the tree. Label the branches uh, with the probabilities. Okay, so let's say from this example, the previous example, how we can uh, describe this as um, a tree table. As you see, so I'm gonna start first by ages, okay? So let's say the ages. I have 100 people as um, uh, 30 years old or younger, and they have 225 as a three, uh, between three, 30 to 60, and I have uh, 175, which is over 60. So I organize my probability dependent on the age as, a, as you see. Now, okay, if, uh, sorry, now you have to organize it dependent on the infants of age. Now, how many people, they are 30 year old or younger, haven't attended any movies? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, take this and make the probability, count the probability of zero, so it's gonna be 0 0.03. So if I give you the tree, uh, tree diagram and ask you what is the probability that uh, the selected person uh, 30, between 30 and 60 year old 
and he only attended one or two movies. So we can start from ages. The age, as I said, is 30, between 30 and six. So I'm going to go like this. Now I said, attend one or two movies. So we're going to do like this. So the variety is 20. Okay. So in the exam, if I gave you the three diagram and I ask you questions uh, to give the answer, so you will follow the same procedure also. If I ask you what is the probability that the selected person is 60 year old or older and he attend six or more movies. Okay, so we'll start from age. What is the 60 year old or older is this one. So I'm gonna like go like this. And now uh, he attend six or more movies. So we're gonna move like this. So the probability is 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.06, okay? This is how you calculate uh, the probability based on tree diagram. Okay, another example, as you see here, this is also, if I ask you um, uh, about loyalty, okay, what is the chance uh, the customer that I pick, he would, wouldn't remain, and he is between one to five years. Oh, sorry, the surface is between one to five years. Okay, what is the chance? So you're gonna start. Where's the wooded dreamy? Is this? No, the surface is one to five years, so the chance is 0 0.05. Okay, now tree diagram is useful when I ask you to, uh, to give me information, but the most important thing is to understand how it's work. Okay, now uh, we have another uh, topic, it's called principle of counting. We have a multiplication formula. So the multiplication uh, formula stated that if there, there are N ways of doing one thing, okay, and M ways of doing another thing, there, there are M times N ways of doing both. So if I have one event and I have many ways to do it, and they have another event and I have many ways to do it, so the chance or, um, or uh, the ways of doing both is called uh, multiplication. We can use here multiplication formula. So multiplication formula is the number of arrangement, which is equal to M times N. What M is the way of doing the first event and N is the another way to doing um, the, the second event. And MN is the ways of doing both events at the same time. Okay, so let's say an automobile dealer wants to advertise that for uh, $29,999, you can buy uh, a comfortable two-door or a four-doors model with your choice of either wear wheel cover or solid wheel covers. Okay, now how many different vehicles can the dealer offer? Okay, now how many types of car? So the N is the model that he have. He has, this is the first model, and this is the second model, and this is the third model. So the dealer has three models, as you see here, the green and orange and uh, uh, I think the brown. Now, the, this is the first way of advertising uh, his products, okay? now. The possible way of M is equal to three. What about N? N is the choice of either wire wheel cover or solid wheel cover. So this is wheel cover, as you see it here, and this is the solid cover, okay? So now this category, and this is the other category. So I have two ways. So N is two. Now. If I want to sell all um, to my items, okay, so how many ways I can arrange my advertising? So it's going to be M times N, which is three times two, it's going to be six. Okay, so I could advertise for the first car. The car is two doors, okay, with a wheel, uh, a wheel cover, a wire wheel cover. Or I can say the uh, the car is two door 
with a solid weight cover. So this is, this is the first and this is the second. Also, I can say um, the, the car is two doors, uh, the orange two doors with the wire wheel cover. Okay, so it's going to be three method of uh, the third method. Or I could say two door with a solid wheel cover, which is the, three, uh, the fourth. Okay, now I could say for the brown, they are four door with the wire wheel cover, which is five. And all I can say for door with solid wheel cover, which is six. So how many ways I can advertise my product? Six ways. Okay. Now the permutation formula, which is another counting formula used to determine the total number of outcome. Okay. So first we learn multiplication formula, which is the first principle of counting. Another method is called permutation formula. We use this also to determine the total number of outcome. Here, the arrangement is important when you use uh, permutation. So if I give you a question, how we can distinguish uh, which method you use. If, if it is required arrangement, then use permutation formula, okay? So, permutation, any arrangement of our object selected from a single group of n possible outcome, okay? so. It's our objectives and selected from n possible outcome. So we present it like n permutation r equal to n factor divided by n minus r factor. Okay, so let's say if I have, uh, let's say this example, the, if there are three electric parts to be assembled. Okay, so three electric bark, which is, let's say I have uh, A uh, for, for my charger and B for my coffee machine, for example. Okay, and C for my, let's say, C uh, for my TV. Okay, now the electric bark that I have are three. So n equal to three. Now, because all of three to be insert in the black n component three, I have a black n like this, okay? This is my black n. How many ways I could arrange my E and B and C uh, electronic part to the uh, black n, which is component three, okay? So now my n here is three and my R is three. How many ways I can arrange A and B, C here? First, we have to count how many possible outcomes. I'm going to use this formula as N is equal uh, to 3. Let's change the color. B and 3. So it's equal to 3 factor because here it's N, 3 and three minus three factor. It's going to be equal to three factor, zero factor. So it's going to be, now, now by default, zero factor is equal to one. This is by default. So I'm going to write it down, zero factor equal to one. This is rule, okay? So it's going to be, now how we can calculate the three factor? You will multiply three by two by one. If you have five, you're gonna multiply five by four by three, two times one, okay? So you start, reduce the number and multiply. Okay, now it's multiplying over one because I had said zero factor by default, it's one. So three times two times one is gonna be six. So how many ways to, um, to insert the three electric bar to the black N, I have six ways. Can we do it? Yes. So the first two ways, I'm going to do it like this. Let me write it here. So this is the black. Okay, so I could first insert A and B and C. 
or I could put it like A, C, and B. Or I could change it as a B, A, C, or B, C, A. Or I could change it as a C, A, B, or C, B, A. So how many ways I did that? Six ways. Okay. Did I uh, repeat any of my outcome? No, they are not repeated. So this is how we can calculate the permutation. The arrangement is required and the outcome, they are not repeated. Okay, now the, uh, the combination formula, which is also another accounting formula, which is useful in determining the total number of outcomes. A combination is arrangement where the order of objects selected is not important. Here is different than the permutation because the order is not important. Okay, so the formula is n uh, n uh, combination with r is equal to n factor divided by the r factor times n minus r factor. Okay, this is the formula. Uh, how we can apply it? So let's say the example. Remember, in here is the total number of objects. R is the number of objects selected. Okay, so let's see an example. So the example said a grand, uh, the grand 60 movie theater uses teams of three employees. Okay, uh, teams of three employees to work. Uh, the condition stand each technique. So they have the total 16. Uh, 16 employee. Okay, so our 16 teams. Now, from the 16, they want to create three. Uh, they uh, wanted to create teams. Okay, teams. Each team has three employees to work as a, a concession stand each ethnic. So they are, sorry, they are seven employee. Let's make clear it. So there are seven employees. From these seven, they wanted to create teams, each teams from three uh, employees that will work in the night, in the evening. Okay. How many different teams can be scheduled? Okay, here the important is not, the arrangement is not important. You can uh, choose um, the same employee like uh, many times. Even if it's repeated, it's not important. Okay, so how many ways? Let's say, I'm gonna apply first the formula. So in here is seven, which is the total employee combination with three, which is the number of team they want. Now I'm gonna apply seven factor, three factors times seven minus three factors. Okay, now N and R, I apply the formula. So seven factors is seven times six, five, four, three, two, one, divided three factors, which is um, three times two times one. Now, seven minus four, which is four factor. So it's gonna be four times three times two times one. You have to stop at one, okay? Now I'm, I'm gonna start to count. First, this one is gonna go away from this. Okay, by cancellation method. Now I have three times two times one, which is six. So it's going to be with cancellation method. So I only have seven times four, uh, five is going to be 35. So I have 35 ways of creating team from uh, contain three employees from all the seven. I have 35 ways. Can you imagine that? So this is interesting about the combination formula. It will give you the total number of ways of doing something. Okay, when the arrangement is not required. If the arrangement here is required, then use the permutation formula. So this is the end of chapter five. Hopefully it's clear. Uh, I'm gonna now uh, start by uh, end of the chapter review. I will give you some exercise to work on. So the first one is, I have this table, okay, uh, the, uh, it's about a survey that's conducted 
So this or no and undecided responses to the survey question are broken down according to the employment status and sample result are given below. So now how many employees that I um, that I uh, survey 60 employee and employee 40. So the total number that I have 100. Okay, now let's say for the first question, if person is selected at random, what is the probability that he is an employee? So how many total number of an employee number that I have? 40. Okay, so the probability of an employee is equal to the 40 divided by 100, which is the total. So it's going to be 0 0.4. Okay, now B, if a person selected at random, what is the probability that he said no? How many people that I have, he said no? This is no. How many people? 40. So the probability of people who said no is equal to the 40 divided by the total number, which is 100. So it's going to be 0 0.4. Okay, now A, if a person is selected at random, what is the probability that he is an employee and he said yes? Okay, so it should be he is an employee and he said yes. So where's people who said yes here? And uh, it said an employee. So this is an employee. And this is people who said yes. So they are in the section here, which is 20. So how many people? They are at the same time and enable with and say yes, 20. Okay, so I'm going to solve now. So the probability is equal to the 20 divided uh, by the total, which is 100. So it's going to be 0 0.2. Okay, B. Now giving, so this is, this is conditional. Giving that the selected person is an employee. So I'm gonna look only for an employee. Okay, I'm gonna look only for employee here, which is the total here, it will be 40. Because I'm only looking for the employee, uh, an employee. Now, so I'm gonna only looking for the employee, what is a double probability that he is undecided. So where is undecided people from the employee and employment people is five. Okay, so I'm gonna start. Probability is equal to the five divided by 40. Why, why 40? Because the, uh, the condition here, I only should look to the unemployed people and to the number I have 40. So five over 40 is gonna be 0 0.125, which is the probability. Uh, see, giving that selected person say yes. So here, the condition, the person should say yes. So this is, I'm only looking here. So the total here is 50. Okay, now, what is a double what he is an employee? So where is the employee from people who said yes? 30. So I'm going to say a double what is equal 30 divided by the total number, which is 50. Why I chose 50? Because the condition, I only have to look to the people who said yes. And the total of people who said yes are 50. So it's going to be 0 0.6. Okay, so this is the idea. Hopefully it's clear. Uh, second schedule, it's almost the same uh, of doing it as we did in the previous question. I answered already in the slide. Now, question 10. In a class of 20... Uh, five students, there are 10 students, okay, remember, 10 students are in the drama club, 16 students in the social club, five students are both drama and social club, and five students who are not in any of the clubs. So I'm going to start here from the joint part, which is five students are both in drama and social. So I have by five students, which is both in drama and social. So where is the area that is considered as a both is this area, which is the joint part. 
Okay, so this is five. Now, four are in, not in any of the club, so here my four, which is out. Now, I have only 25 students, 10 students who are in drama. I only have five as in drama students. So the remaining of the 10 are five. Okay, 16 students who are in the social club. I only have five in social club. Okay, so the remaining of 16, 11. Okay, now 11 and 15 plus 15 is 16, which is the total because we have here a joint part. Uh, so five here is represent the people who between the two, they uh, join the two clubs. Okay, this is important. If you calculate this is correct, then you can answer all of the question correctly. Now, if the student selected at random, what is the probability that he is neither in drama club nor in social club? So the student will be outside of the drama and social. How many students that we have? It's outside four. So B is equal to the four divided by the total number 25, which is 0.16. Now, if you, cal if you calculate all the numbers here, it's going to be 25. But if you mistakenly add put here like 16 and here put 10 and calculate it, you will end up with the number greater than 25. So be careful. First, start with the joint and then uh, organize the numbers dependent on the requirement. C, if the student is selected at random, what is the probability that he is either in the drama club or in the social club? So the question asks about this part. Okay. Now let's say uh, probability A or B equal to probability of A. Let's say here is, is our uh, D because we have D or S. So probability of D plus probability of S minus probability of D and S. D and S here is represented um, uh, the drama and social. Okay, now probability of D that I have in drama club 10, the total 25, probability of social 16, which is over 25, minus the joint, which is 5, over 25, so it's going to be 21 divided by 25. So it's going to be, um, so it's going to be here uh, 25. I'm going to make a division. 21 divided by 25, 0 0.94. Or you can take the complement. You can say, since they are not here, so it's one probability of none, okay, because they are outside. So it's going to be one minus four over 25. So it's going to be 21 over 25 equal to 0 0.84. So you have a choice to apply the general rule of addition or use a couple of it. But be careful when, which one to pick. The question here said uh, the uh, student is should be in either drama club or social club. Okay. Now, hopefully it's clear. If you have any question, reach me. This is important to understand. So be careful when you understand when you study this question. Start by the joint, which is for the social the remaining of social 11th and here 5 and 4. So if I ask you how many students in, if I give you the Venn diagram and ask you how many uh, students in social club, you have to calculate 11th with the joint. So it's 11th plus 5 is 16. In drama, 5 plus 5 is 10. So be careful. Do not skip the joint. Now, last question is uh, a survey of top exhaustive uh, referred that 35% of them read Time magazine, 20% read 
uh, news week and 40% read US news. They are 10% read both Times and US news. So A, what is the probability that a particular top executive read news week? Okay, so they are giving us the percentage. So 20% comforted, um, let's say the probability. equal to uh, of new week equal to 20% of the comfort to this someone is going to be 0 0.20 okay now what is uh, what is the probability that particular topic is to read either times or us news okay i now since said or since said it's or i'm going to use the general rules of addition so the general rules it's been a probability that they read uh, times or us news okay it's going to be a probability of times news plus probability of us news minus probability of uh, times and US news. Okay, so it's going to be the probability of times, which is 35%, to this sum was 0 0.35 uh, plus US, which is 40, so it's going to be 0 0.40 minus reading both, which is 10%, so 0 0.1, so it's going to be 0 0.65. Okay. Last question, what is the probability that partic uh, particular topic is to read neither times or nor, uh, neither times nor US news? So I'm going to use the complement for uh, people who read. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use, sorry, I'm going to use the complement here for a probability of people who read uh, times and you uh, oh, sorry times or US news. Okay, so I'm going to start. Probability is equal to 1 minus probability of people who read times or uh, US in news. Okay, now the probability we counted here, which is 0 0.65, it's going to be 0 0.35. So the probability that a particular topic is if reads no times or no US in use, so they won't read any of them. Use the complement of people who read already them. Okay, so this is the end of chapter uh, five. Hopefully, is clear. If not, you can ask anytime. And thank you. Hopefully, you have um, a smooth quiz.